All right, here we go. Sean Fennis is here. Chris Ryan is here. We're doing this in person because this movie demands it. 40th anniversary of one of the greatest movies of all time, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You guys might have heard of it. Um, it ended up on a lot of lists when people do those lists of the 500 best movies ever, the 100 best movies of the last 50 years, whatever. It's always on the list. I think for me, this is kind of the breaking point from old movies and new movies. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's how I look at it. I don't know if I look at that because I was 12 or 11 when I saw this in 1981, and this is when I kind of understood what made movies. We talked about how Jaw was the first, Jaws was the first great modern movie, but I feel like this is the bridge to where everything's going. Because you think about 1982, that's when all of a sudden First Blood shows up and 48 Hours and E.T. and movies that start to feel like modern movies. Do you think this was the bridge, Sean Fennessy? I do. I think that's a good point that you made. I think Jaws is the first true blockbuster and Indiana Jones perfects the blockbuster. This is the movie that figures out what you need to do to captivate audiences is nonstop. Go, go, go. Set piece to set piece to set piece. Hold your audience's attention at every turn. And if you can do it as well as Steven Spielberg, you make an iconic movie. This is like one of the only movies that has withstood 40 consecutive years of other movies and, and can stand on its shoulders. Every 10 minutes, there's something happens. I mean, that was the plan. That was what they imagined because they were going to base it off of these, these serials that they grew up watching, these like quick, these short films that they grew up watching. And when you watch a Fast Furious movie now, that's the same thing. It's like something happens every 10 minutes. This is Big like, opening scene. It's the blueprint. It's the Slow blueprint down. for every action movie that came after it. And they used it with this very nostalgic way of like kind of paying homage to what came before them. But like their idea to never let the audience catch their breath uh, kind of changed mainstream movie making f forever. Pauline Kale didn't like it. We'll get to her later. Um, this is a movie that you, it's been in my life basically since I've had a memory. And I've kind of forgotten some of the basic pieces. And I just wrote down Spielberg, Lucas, Kasdan, Marshall, <laughs> Williams, Kaufman. These are like six iconic guys who are all involved in their fascinating points of their career. Lawrence Kasdan writes the script. Spielberg is cold. Mm -hmm. He's coming off 1941, which I will tell you was a very disappointing movie experience for a young Billy Simmons. <laughs> like, fired, fired it up this week just to see like where he was at at that time. Couldn't get through it. Just it's did not really enjoy rough. It. And, and also, it's like Belushi as like kind of a crazed pilot Bluto pro and probably on a ton of cocaine. It's just not a good movie. Wasn't in movie jail, but like that was over budget. That was like off schedule. Like he didn't, you know, like he, even, even though he, you think you make Jaws, you get a couple of ones for you, but he, he was- a, And Close Encounters, yeah. back to back years. Yeah. But 1941, it's like, this kid's lost it. And uh, Lucas, who I don't know if you guys have heard of George mm -hmm. Lucas, but mm -hmm. he created the Star Wars franchise. What? American Graffiti, a couple other things. <laughs> Holy shit. He had some success early in his career. Yeah. And he's basically fighting for Spielberg and these two collaborate and it becomes, I don't know, would you say it's the most important producer-director partnership we've ever had? That's a that's a pretty bold one. I'd probably have to think about that a little while. I think it's the most significant. These two guys who are close friends really wanted to work together, and they got a chance. Like it, they understood and each it worked other, out. and it yeah. worked out. You know, it didn't blow up in their face. Like these two guys love each other, and they relate on a lot of levels, and they're from the same generation, and they're interested in the same stuff, but they complement each other. You know, Lucas is not a great film director. He's a great conceiver of big ideas for movies. And that there's a reason he doesn't direct the second and third Star Wars movies. And you can see in the 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 the, the trilogy that comes in the 2000s that he's not a great filmmaker, but his concepts and his conception of how to make a big movie is fits perfectly with Spielberg, who's like the ultimate technician, mm -hmm. the ultimate storyteller. The and a sap. Yes. And he, and he like infuses this movie with so much romance and so much sentimentality in different places. And also like... Maybe a connection, because this is a Jewish filmmaker making a movie about the Nazis being the ultimate force of evil that I don't know that Lucas necessarily would have been in touch with had he directed it. Right. I was thinking about the Nazi part. In 1981, and this is set in 1936, which is 45 years, that's actually not that long of a time. No. If you made a movie that was 45 years ago right now in 2021, that would take you to 1976 when Jaws came out. Not that long ago no 19 did i do that right I yeah can yeah, barely that's, that's yeah my yeah. age yeah. yeah yeah and i like remember 1976 was when rocky and jaws like it's not that far away from now and it's i i think 
now that World War II and all of that stuff really seems far away, right? Just wasn't that far away. And the Nazis are the greatest villains you could ever have in a movie. I mean, we we talked about what Lethal Weapon Two. Mm-hmm. The evil South Africa, the, South African the Aryan guys. South yeah, African. Yeah, but they're still the silver medalists. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they just can never top the Nazis. And then the most satisfying conclusion, probably in any movie ever, of basically all of them getting their faces melted <laughs> by the art. <laughs> you, can't, you can't come up with a better end than that. The thing that's cool is like you're saying with this group of people working on it. And one of the reasons why I think this movie is kind of remained in our lives is there's so much stuff about the movie like these guys actually mm. acknowledge like we did something pretty special like you know maybe we'd meant to maybe we didn't maybe we thought it would work maybe it wouldn't but you know you can still read the transcripts from the story sessions that Lucas and Spielberg had when they were like conceiving of this movie and you can see it all there you know what I mean like they're like let's do a little bit from Seven Samurai, but let's do a little bit from like, was it Don Winslow in the Navy is yeah, one of the serials the that they based it on and a little bit of Errol Flynn and a little bit of this. And then they're kind of arguing back and forth. Like he should be this, he should be that. He there's shouldn't some, be this. There's a tough moment with that whole thing yeah. about the making Marion Karen Allen's character was to say he's, she was 15 and he was 25 when they got together. And it's like, I, I, think, think, I think they started at 11, that she was 11 when they, when he first met her and, and started fraternizing with her and so like this stuff had to evolve too that's the other thing is that Lucas's ideas anytime you read about where he starts with an idea he needs a collaborator (laughs) like Spielberg (laughs) clearly pulled him off the ledge on a couple of things and and that's a huge thing and also Philip Kaufman helped come up with the idea and as you said Kasdan ended up writing the screenplay you have this convergence of five or six people who really were like at the top of their game in the late 70s early 80s working together to get to this point if it was just Lucas this would not be a movie we'd be talking about on the show, I don't think. And you talk about the page turning thing is like these guys kind of made this movie quasi independently, you know? I mean, like in in, in the sense that they were like, this is what we're going to do. This is who's going to do what. Do you want to buy this? You know, and that that changed things too. Let's talk Lucas. So uh, for the kids listening at home, he came up with the idea of this in the early 70s. He wanted to do the serial films earlier, 20th century, Book Rogers. Zorro's Fighting Legion, Spy Smasher. I didn't even know what those movies were. You didn't, Craig, you, have you ever heard of any of those movies? No. Yeah. Okay. So can can I very briefly just explain what it was? Yeah. There's no television in the 1930s and 40s. People would go to movie theaters and they would pay to watch these 30-minute or hour-long reels. And they were episodes of TV effectively. So you would have to return week after week to see the new episode. So CR's crush in Mayor of Easttown recently. He's able to do it from the comfort of his own home because of the modern wonders of technology. You're talking to Kate Winslet out there. Right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but back then, if you wanted to check out the latest adventures of Zorro, you had to go to the movie theater. And so yeah. it created this kind of viewing habit. It kind of invented television and movies simultaneously. Binge yeah. mode Buck Rogers? Totally. You Let's had a little bit, just now, Just you had a little bit of you, you think you're better than me about Kate Winslet. You looked at me <laughs> and you're like, you think you're better um, than me talking Jesus, to Kate Winslet? Yeah, twice. You could have fucking shared her. Um, so... He he called it Indiana Smith. He was doing American Graffiti, uh-huh. which which hit. I uh, I unfortunately saw the sequel in the theater with my dad, and it was rough. It's not a good movie. More American Graffiti. More American Graffiti <laughs> was uh, not good. But um, he decided uh, he's gonna gonna do a movie called Star Wars after he tried to get Flash Gordon, couldn't get it, and was like, I'll create my own space opera serial. Um, so that happens. He's talking to Philip Kaufman. Give the quick Philip Kaufman background. Uh, just like an important and interesting filmmaker from the 1970s, I think it's probably his best movie. I guess his two best movies are The Right Stuff and uh, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers remake, mm-hmm. but just like a sophisticated genre-hopping storyteller who made some good good flicks. And a pretty fascinating character in Adventures in the Screen Trade, the Goldman book, when Goldman writes about his mm. issues with writing right stuff and working with Coffin. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Anytime you guys are ready for the rewatch, that, that one. one. Yeah, man. <laughs> 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 a, lot of good, a lot of good Nimoy in that one, too. That's just a good movie. Good San Francisco movie, too. So Kaufman, initially, they're like this Indiana Smith. He's going to be like a womanizer, playboy guy. And he's like, no, no, no. Just, just put him on a quest. Give, this, give him this Ark of the Covenant. Ark of Covenant. Ark of the Covenant. Ark, you got it. Yeah. Yeah, I had it the first time. And that'll be the quest. Just Forget the all half. this. Drop all this other stuff. Just make this like he's got to find this Ark. So they go. Lucas sees Spielberg in 78. They start doing the thing. They're like two buddies. They get Larry Kasdan. Hey, help us write this stuff. Nobody knows who the fuck he is. Spielberg's telling Kasdan, 
do this thing. Don't do the American Graffiti sequel. It's going to suck because he's trying to get him for that. That doesn't happen. And he ends up writing this script. Give him the Lawrence Kasdan background. Uh, a, a screenwriter who is widely considered the voice of Han Solo, um, somebody who wrote the screenplay for The Empire Strikes Back and um, went on to make a number of other great movies, including one of your favorites, Body Heat. Um, somebody who has a lot of... Ad- Wait, but he made a more of my favorite than Body Heat. What Big else? Chill? Big Chill. Big Chill, yeah. of course. It's- Person who is considered he wrote, like directed the Big Chill. He's like a generational he interpreter. He did. He does stuff in other kinds of movies. What's his West? Is Silverado, Silverado. his Western? Yeah. Um, he does something very similar to Indiana Jones, which is he looks back into the past and the way that filmmakers were making movies in the '40s and '50s, and does his own version of them. But he has a real affinity for snappy dialogue, mm-hmm. especially snappy dialogue in absurd sequences. So he's kind of a perfect fit for writing a story like this. I ended up at a dinner with him once. And uh, I completely nerded out. Did you? He loved it. Yeah. He loved it. But I was just like, I just couldn't get enough of just telling him how great he was and going through his movies and trying to get stories. And like, he's a fucking legend. So we basically have Lucas, one of the great visionaries of the last 75 years. We have Spielberg, who's widely considered to be, I think, one of the five best directors of the last 100 years. And then Kasdan, who's one of the best screenwriters of the last 50 years. They all get together. And it's like, hey, what else can we do? We'll get John Williams to do the music, Mm -hmm. and Frank Marshall is going to be a producer, and he ends up becoming one of the best, most successful producers of the last 40 years. So this is like the fucking dream team. They don't know this in 1981. Retroactively, we know this, Mm -hmm. but- I mean, At the time, we didn't totally know. There's this. more if you want to keep piling on. Like, Michael Kahn is the editor of this movie. This is the guy who would go on to become Spielberg's longtime editor to this day. He mm. has cut some of his best movies, including, like, it, watch Saving Private Ryan if you want to see a master class on how to edit a movie. Also, Douglas Slocum shot this movie, who shot movies in England for Ealing Studios and made movies like Kind Hearts and Coronets and is considered one of the greatest kind of like stagers of sequences with directors. And so like you have all of these people coming together all at the same time to make something so magical. So I think Lucas has to get a shitload of credit for that. He was a very good talent Mm -hmm. assembler. Totally. Which I think gets lost in the whole. And think um, about how iconic those, you know, this movie graffiti and Star Wars are. Yeah. And think about how many no names he was working with. Like, think about think about how many people wind up coming through those three movies and being part of our lives for 50 years that, no, you know, like, we're basically out of nowhere, Ford yeah. included. I mean, very high batting average. Mark Hamill, probably the biggest whiff. I mean, is he's, that on Lucas, though? Yeah, he's like a C-. Um, just trying to get the Star <laughs> Wars Tough, tough beat for, for Hamill yeah, here. He's, they, we're in celebration mode. There's better actors, but Lucas was awesome. Uh, Spielberg. So he goes Duel and Sugarland Express becomes the hot young director, leads to Jaws, which we cover in the rewatchables, which is still an amazing achievement. Um, and at that point, he's the number, he's the LeBron of directors. Close encounters, massive hit. Wanna do any Richard Dreyfus lines here or no? <laughs> <laughs> I loved working. No. Uh, 1941, ice cold. And then rips off Raiders, E.T., and Indiana Jones 2, reviled, but made a ton of money yeah. all in the spans of four years. Yeah. And it's and we're off with Spielberg. Then he gets into the weird colored purple phase and goes through all these different phases that hunting. we go with him. Yeah, but right. turns out he had a pretty good career, ultimately, is my take. Yeah, his 80s are really interesting because yeah. he made seven movies and he participated in a bunch of stuff. You know, there's the rumors that he co-directed Poltergeist, which have been somewhat debunked. He participates in the Twilight Zone, the movie movie. Goonies. Goonies. He's second unit director, but obviously helped out a lot there. But he makes seven films that are his films. And three of those movies are Indiana Jones movies. That's yeah. how much he cotton to this franchise and that's how big a hit it was that a guy who basically could write you know his own check for any movie wanted to do indie movies he said here's a quote from him on 1941 i became a bit like colonel kurtz (laughs) after my big successes the studio was too afraid to dispatch martin sheen to terminate my command with extreme prejudice now i just wanted to make a movie where people would say he's a responsible director who came in under budget under schedule that feels like an emailed answer not something that somebody would actually say say. with their mouth But that's what the point he was at. It is weird. We were in this time back then where if you made a bad movie, your career completely fell apart. Right. And, and it, you know, like in sports or something, if you lose in round one or round two one year, nobody's like, it's over for this guy. But in, in the 70s and 80s, you could just have one bad one 
And it was a fucking tailspin. That's a really interesting kind of email response. Very similar to the email I got from Chris this morning after he uh, knocked out Winslet Part 2. He's <laughs> like, I'm just trying to do steady podcasts on my terms. I'm just trying to come in under budget. <laughs> uh, Harrison Ford, another key piece of this. Oh, yeah. I think you guys have heard of him. He rips off Star Wars, Apocalypse Now, Empire Strikes Back, Raiders, Blade Runner, and Return of the Jedi in a seven-year span, <laughs> which <laughs> I think crazy. might be the best seven years anyone's ever had, I'll just go, from I a mean, commercial standpoint. But like the the 20 years, like a 20-year run from 73 to 93, that is like, do you want to go through it? Do you want to expand yeah, give it? Give it to the people. You want to go all the way to the fugitive? Graffiti Conversation, Star Wars, Apocalypse Now, Empire Strikes Back, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Blade Runner, Return of the Jedi, Temple of Doom, Witness, Mosquito Coast, Frantic Working Girl, Presumed Innocent, Patriot Games, Fugitive. Get the fuck out of here. Are you That's kidding crazy. me? Crazy. Oh, how, he, many, how many rewatchables are in there? How many movies that we just crazy. straight up adore are in there? How and many he, great directors? And in 93, he's like, I can't hold off Tom Hanks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he's right on my back. I just can't. I'm too old. Yeah, and right. Tom Hanks is like, I'll take this old man. Bob Baffert's like, Tom Hanks. I bet right. <laughs> it did flip pretty quickly when it flipped, but he he had the belt forever. I mean, he was he was the signature star for 20 years in American movies. And isn't he like the quintessential guys want to be him, girls want to be with him? Like there's just like a, so much mass appeal. No like weird. I mean, like the the plant the plane stuff later in life became strange, but like there was never like the weird crew stuff. Like it's just Harrison Ford is just fucking cool. Like that's just it. His persona, though, is really interesting and a little bit unexamined because he's pretty freaking grouchy in this movie and grouchy in kind of every movie. Every and story about any movie he's in, he just seems prickly. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. Karen Allen in the research for this one is like, you know, I really want to talk about the characters and Harrison is just like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my trailer and get dysentery again. Thanks anyway. <laughs> you can feel that in the movies. Yeah. And it, it's in a way that is magically not unlikable. You know, like he still emits this like this charisma, this thing you want to be close to, even though it's like you can kind of tell he's a prick or at least is evincing that that feeling. And yet maybe that's like maybe that's what America wanted in the 1980s. Maybe mm -hmm. they wanted somebody who was just a little bit a little bit tough on you. I think the best and worst thing about him as an actor is he could have the exact same chemistry to the T with Chewbacca, Karen <laughs> Allen, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Tommy Lee Jones. It just they just put anyone in front of them and he's gonna yeah. play off them exactly. To the your same. point, we were coming out of a decade where people were like, you know who's a movie star? Peter Falk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. You know, Walter Matthau. Now that guy gets me in the theater. Like it's true. He kind of he's he does kind of split the atom there where he's not this absolute beautiful, perfect Cary Grant type, but he's not Walter Matthau. Yeah. He's got this big cut on his face. You know, he's clearly got a gimpy wing because he hurt himself in the 70s. He's always a little grizzled, and yet he is still matinee idol handsome. Yeah. So he's he's kind of the perfect fusion of 50s and there, 70s. And also, like, just randomly, you'll see, like, I saw, before I even think I knew that we were doing this this week, you just see on Twitter every once in a while, somebody will be like, a picture of him from Raiders, and it's like, that's the hottest person that ever lived. Yeah. It was like a more interesting version of what Clooney tried to get done and couldn't get done. Mm. Yeah. Different time, harder to pull yeah. it off. Um, well, one guy's a leather jacket guy, the other's, the other guy's a suit guy. I was guy. never a huge Star Wars guy. And I, I only we saw the movies, yeah. I don't know, once or twice. But Han Solo was the guy that always jumped out at me and it was always like he was the best part. So, but then, so to go through Raiders with him and then, um, and then eventually the latter part of his career. But when I was in high school... One of my best friends, Jim Grady, was a big Star Wars guy and loved this movie. And like Harrison was his guy. And he just loved Harrison Ford. And he's like, whatever. And I remember when the Fugitive trailer came out, he was so excited. It was like, I don't know if anybody has guys like that anymore. Like nobody's like, I'm a fucking Chris Evans guy, man. <laughs> whatever. CR is. You, I mean, you, you, you would name know the it, Chris but, Evans movie. Yeah. Right. I'm here. That's right. Like there's no. Sean's like that for Bradley Cooper. There's no yeah. star like that. <laughs> Hank's. Probably the closest, but even Hanks, I don't feel like could have done the action piece of this and was very smart to avoid. Well, I think part of like that, that is because the big, a lot of big stars get caught up in franchises and that's really what they do. So like we didn't like 08 to, you know, 2018 or whenever it was like Downey pretty much did Iron, like Avengers movies, you know, like a yeah, lot of to these. To be fair, Harrison made six movies in two worlds, right? 
Sure, and he but he signed also, up like, for Raiders. Listen to the movies I just rattled right, off. Like true. there are he a couple of groundbreaking genre movies, Oscar worthy, you know, rom coms. You know, like like think about all the other stuff he was doing in the twenty year run. I think there are a lot of reasons for it, though. There, accessibility is one of them. Harrison Ford was in his late thirties by the time he got famous and was married to a, a woman who was a screenwriter and lived Most a private life. Enough. He did, yeah. was not on yeah. social media. He was not trying to sell. He's you know, stoned. You know, he, he, yeah. he was probably getting high a lot, yeah. hanging out, um, doing carpentry, stuff he liked to do. The guy, this guy loves the Almond Brothers. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Yeah. So you mentioned Star Wars. I'm curious, like, do you remember seeing this movie? Like, do you remember? Raiders? Yeah, like, oh, I yeah. want to hear, like, you go see this movie and you're like, my life has changed. Yeah. This fucking movie is Dad, like, I'm a man now. So, you know, it was interesting in the research it rekindled, you know, these ancient memories yeah, you course. have that you hadn't thought of in a while. And Superman 2 and Raiders come out in the same summer and Superman 2 just had more hype. And Raiders was the movie that had Han Solo in it. But everyone was more fired up for Superman 2, including myself. Superman 2 was like a really important movie and it was like, there's he's going to have multiple villains he has to go against. He's going to lose his powers. Like we knew enough about that. I don't think anyone saw the Raiders thing coming, but I remember I saw Raiders with my dad and uh, you knew it was going to be good because the criti the critics really loved it and it was just like, this is going to be awesome. Ultimate summer movie, obviously. Um, like, it was you just must so have seen it like four times. It was summer. so fucking like, yeah. satisfying. Yeah. I definitely saw it at least three times. Yeah. Because this was the era and I was going to talk about this later. We might as well talk about this now. Like this was in the theaters for over a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there was, they had this issue and there's a lot of stuff about 80 and 81 and 80 wasn't great for box office. And there's a lot of stuff from back then about what's happening with movies. Movies were just getting weird. I personally think cocaine played a huge part in that. I think the cocaine stuff from 78 on was really starting to make everything weird. And you have just a lot of weird movies like Modern Problems, like that Chevy Chase movie. Mm -hmm. A lot of those type of movies where you're just like, what happened? Were these people on drugs? Yes. It turns out they were. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so <laughs> Superman 2 and Raiders and kind Don of Simpson revived came this. through and cleaned everything yeah, up. Yeah, Don Simpson's <laughs> like, I got this. But th those two movies, people would just go to the theater, and if those two were sold out, then you saw something else. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was the entire summer. We talked about that. I, I want to say it was the first Godfather pod that we did. Where, just the amount of the totality of people that saw the movie. And the length of time it played in theaters. We talked yeah. about it back to the future as well. Where like in 85, Josh, this movie opened at this time and it opened in the summer and then they basically re-ran it in October. And it was yeah. number two at the box office six months later. Yeah, I and mean, we dwelled on stuff more back then for better or for worse. Yeah. I mean, like that that you always think about that. I always remember like being a really little kid, but just having very clear memories of that 84 year where it just felt like Thriller, Born in the USA, and like a virgin, were just on the radio, seven singles each, all all year. That was yeah. just all that was on. And it was like, cool, This is these are the only three records I really need. I mean, I'm, for one thing, I'm like eight. But for the other thing, like this, the, these, this completely satisfies every itch you could scratch in music. And that's kind of like what Raiders is. I mean, like there's very few films that like, you know, you watch it and there's some, you know, some of the special effects maybe aren't like as top notch, even as like the ones in Last Crusade. But it does still make me feel like a kid when I watch it. I just yeah. can't believe it. Like, it's as like soon an amusement as you park hear the ride. music, you're like. That's exactly what Craig said before he started recording. It feels like an amusement yeah, park ride. Which they knew because they made two different rides for it. You know, they right. have the Disneyland one. They have the stunt thing. Well, we Orlando. talk a lot about, we did this with Memento. We talked about pre-internet, these different eras that movies have. 81 to me is this last year before cable really comes in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 82 is when everybody started to get cable. So you have that, but you also have, and we'll get to this later, but Raiders completely remodels the whole VHS thing. So people are starting to get VHSs, but the tapes cost like $129. Like they made them for whatever reason crazy. Raiders, I think was like 40. Mm -hmm. So reasonable. 40 back then is like 100 now. But if you really love Raiders, you could buy it and then you could own it and you could watch it 700 times. I remember Jim Grady, who I mentioned earlier, he had, I think, Rocky Three on VHS. And we would just watch, go over and be like, let's watch Rocky Three again. It was like, what else are we going to do? We have 12 cable channels. I was, um, you know, this the, movie, he, th that was one of the reasons it kept going. And the reason why you would buy this movie is because like a pure rewatchable, like the kind of current, like, the re original kernel of this of this pie was like kind of talking about movies that no matter where you jump in, yeah. you, you, you're like, oh, I'll finish it now or I'll, I want to wait to see this. 
no matter where you are in this movie, you're less than 10 minutes away from something big happening. Yeah, maybe I, even I went, less. I it's went like through seven. and like actually wrote down like what happens at the tenth minute, the twentieth minute, the thirtieth mm. minute. It's always a cliffhanger or like a huge question. You know what I mean? Like, is he going to get out of the well of souls? Like that is, and it happens every ten minutes. Like a, you wonder whether or not they like engineered storytelling on an almost elemental level like that. I didn't want to watch it with Ben, my son, yeah. who's thirteen, because he didn't want him to not like it. I think he would have. I'm ninety percent sure he would have. There's ten percent of me that was worried that he wouldn't like it and then I would just lose faith in humanity going forward. Right. Well, but it's a question of pacing, right? Because at this time, it felt breakneck when it was released, but by today's standards, it's maybe a little bit slower than a Marvel movie might be in terms of where the set pieces come and are yeah. there enough wisecracks. The one thing for me, though, with this movie, it came out before I was born. It's a it's a self-label classic. Like in my house, we didn't buy, we didn't spend $40 on the movie. We taped the movie off HBO. Right. And then we'd write the label on it, and then we'd put two movies on one thing. Yeah. So we had Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom on one cassette. Yeah. And we would watch them back to back in my house. And, and they would last six hours, so you could get almost three movies. Exactly. If they were three shorter movies. Yeah, that was a great era. I used to, Simmons Family Cape Week, I used to tape movies to bring to the week and would try to fit three. And it was like, <laughs> you know, 1985, you'd have whatever was on HBO, trying to cut that, save enough room yeah. for, and Raiders was on... Anyone who had VHS tapes, Raiders had to be on sure. the thing. And um, it just lived on and on. The, but the quick in the theaters thing. So it comes out on June 12th. Does well. Finishes as number one film of the weekend. Beats Clash of the Titans and History of the World Part 1. Great movie. Um, falls to number three second reason, second weekend behind Cannonball Run and Superman 2. Cannonball Run, another great movie. Um, fourth week... Gets momentum again, reaches number two, six week regains number one, and then is number one for the next nine weeks. This yeah, is would never it, happen it's so again. Weird to ever. think about who like in week six is like, should I see this Raiders movie or what? <laughs> People keep telling me about it. <laughs> People were busy. I don't know what were they doing. What were they doing in nineteen eighty one that they were like, you know what? I'm going to wait six weeks before I see this. <laughs> Movies are out of theaters after six weeks now. Just getting real fired up about Jimmy Carter. I don't know. <laughs> so it lasted uh, forty weeks straight. As one of the top 10 films, and it was yes. in theaters for 13 months. 13 months. Pretty amazing. Kept going and going. Uh, for Harrison Ford, you know, he becomes an A++++ lister. Mm -hmm. Kind of fills the Redford role. Redford's getting a little older. Yep. One thing that I Just think- Just jumps right in there, grabs it. I think really helped him is Empire Strikes Back comes out the year before and ends on the ultimate bummer note where he gets frozen in the carbonite. And you're like, what the fuck? Is Han Solo gone forever? Yeah. And then one year later, he shows up and he's like, no. I'm back, bitches. Yeah, right. And then he gets street cred from Blade Runner a year later, too, which also really helped him. And then did a nice mix of popular with street cred. Yeah. Witness was on recently, which is a really weird movie. But uh, pretty good. Really good. Yeah. But really weird 36 and years working later. Working Girl is like one of the more beloved movies from that decade in a lot of ways. So, um, so great for Ford. Uh, this became the highest grossing film in 1981. 330.5 million worldwide. $20 million budget. So everybody made their money. Lucas and Spielberg both did some crazy royalties shit on this. Yeah. Yeah. They basically reinvented how you should do that. Yeah. And Lucas... They made the deal with Eisner, right? Yeah. Eisner said it was the best script they ever saw. Um, they were very concerned about the budget with Spielberg because he was a little splashy. He splashed the pot every once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, and Stevie KGB. <laughs> the only thing they knew is there was going to be three. So when they got Ford, which we'll get into, there's some unbelievable casting. Some of the best casting what ifs, I think, ever in the history of this podcast. Um, Again, this is how CR did the Winslet deal. It right. Was, it was a three, 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 three pod podcast deal. deal with Kate. She's like, I'd love to. <laughs> um, they do. Uh, Ford is like, hey, if you're in, you got to be in for three. Not thinking he would say no. And he was like, Great, I'm in. Yeah. He's probably stoned out of his mind, is my <laughs> guess. But he signed up. And that led to three sequels, a television series, video games, comic books, novels, theme park attractions, toys. Um, Harrison Ford becoming an A++ lister. Spielberg and Lucas getting fuck you power pretty quickly mm -hmm. to do whatever the it's hell they wanted. It's pretty much up there with Star Wars in terms of the merchandising. In terms of that being like lunchboxes, in terms of like... Kids wearing the fedora for Halloween, you know. Just we got to huge, beat the Nazis again. That huge was great. run on bull whips, you know. The bull whips. I know I was in my backyard <laughs> bull whipping our dog. It's the start of so much for Chris in terms of bull whips. You know, he really got his start 
Apparently, there's a fifth film coming out in 2022. Yeah, if it's Spielberg directing it, James yeah. Mangold is directing it. Yeah, a little nervous about that. 1982 Oscars, five wins: editing, sound, sound editing, art direction, special effects. Can you do me a favor? Is there? Do you have the nominees up right now? I can get it. It I'd got be nominated to know for what beat John Williams's score. It got nominated for best picture and best director and did not win. This is the 1982 Oscars. And 1981. Oh, I've was, got it. It's pretty pretty interesting showdown, actually. Chariots Fire, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chariots for the music. Angelus. Yeah. Da, 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 da. So this this is a pretty good best picture. Chariots of Fire, Atlantic City, On Golden Pond, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Reds. It's fucking loaded, man. Uh, yeah, On Golden Pond, Chris Solo pod coming soon, right? When are you going to do your Reds rewatchables? Uh, it'll be four hours long. <laughs> it'll be me and all the survivors of rewatchables pods speaking on the beauty of the rewatchables. Warren Beatty wins for Reds. Uh -huh. Best director. He beats Louis Molly, Atlantic City. Hugh Hudson for Chariots of Fire. Not a lot of Hugh Hudson talk. He on did this Tarzan pod. and kind of got vanquished by that one. Mark Rydell for On Golden no, Pod. Just, yeah. Spielberg, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. What happens if we redo that Oscar? I think Beatty still wins. Yeah. Beatty was the prom king. You know, he had made, he had directed a bunch of movies or co-directed a bunch of movies at that time. He'd shown a lot of range. Reds is this homage to this incredible moment in world history. It's fucking incredible too. Breathtaking movie. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chariots of Fire winning, I think, is not aged all that well, personally. I think Raiders and Reds are significantly better. I like Atlantic City more too. Ford does not get nominated. Nobody gets nominated for an actor thing. And then, uh, and then for screenplay, shut up. Hmm. They I were like, no thanks. I didn't realize that. Paul and Kale, people listening are back then. <laughs> I don't think that's why I don't uh, think that's why it happened. <laughs> your best original score went to Chariots. Okay. Do you remember what best original song was for the 1982 Oscars? Was it Chariots of Fire by Eddie Let me Money? just tell you, this is <laughs> Chariots of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> this chariot's on fire. Uh it was Arthur's theme. It's burning. It was uh when you get caught between a moon and New York City. It's Arthur? I know it's crazy, but it's true. <laughs> that one, Endless Love by Lionel Richie. I don't yeah. know what Let's he Let's hear a little do. bit of that, Bill. Go ahead. Fire away. Lionel Richie? Who, who was in that with him? Diana Ross? I don't remember. I don't know if I've seen Endless Love. Uh, the first time it happens, Great Muppet Caper. Four Year Eyes Only from Four Years Eyes Only, and then uh, One More Hour from Ragtime. So, um, Interesting. I mean, the thing about this is... This is a continuation of Lucas dominating the technical awards at the Oscars, which he did with Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, and he does here, where there's this sense that everyone who worked on this movie below the line is like at the top of their game, mm -hmm. but yeah. they're at the top of their game because they're working with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, who are challenging them to be great. Like we, you mentioned like the sort of synchronicity every 10 minutes, this was the most storyboarded movie that Spielberg yeah. had made to this point. Like, he knew exactly it, what he wanted to do. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think about how much of it is shot on sound stages in England. You know, yeah. to, for the amount of, like, globe-trotting that it does. Like, so much of the temples, so much of the stuff, interiors are all just, like, in, in England. You know? <laughs> for Oscar standpoint, I think the only tough one is not getting a screenplay nomination is pretty, pretty bad. Mm -hmm. The screenplay is... Amazing. Yeah, that's a pretty weird one. So, Don't Chariots of Fire, one. Absence of Malice, Arthur, Atlantic City, and Reds. I mean, Arthur over Raiders of the Lost Ark? Arthur as a best screenplay? Yeah, it's pretty weird. It's like, yeah, this drunk guy with a club foot in New York City. Um, Roger Ebert, our guy, four stars. Went to the mattresses for this one. He really did. He called it a series of breathless and incredible adventures and just loved it. Had enough story for Raj. This is one of his calling his shot moments in his career where he's like, Spielberg has has arrived at the top of his game. Pauline Kael, who I think had about as much <laughs> You mentioned her three clout, times now, so yeah. Well, as much clout as probably she yeah. ever had at this point. And is really, the, the review is fascinating. She is so dismissive. I mean, she's amused. She said it's fine, has some good things, but is just kind of shits all over it. And um how there's no point to it and it's a cheap thrill ride, that kind of stuff. And uh, it was just weird. Yeah, well, in you, a weird way, she's probably as prescient as Ebert because she's seeing the game change right in front of her. That's she's what it is. Like, and that's why that review is really great to reread because she's basically like, 
this is a really good movie, but here's what I don't like. This is what everything is going to be going forward, and I'm not here for that. And she called it. It's uh, it's almost a perfect example of the Ebert school of criticism and Kale school of criticism in terms of like what they're looking for and how they're responding to the way that the movies are changing. And he is seeing the upside of the way that someone like Spielberg is making these thrill rides. And she's saying, welcome to the 80s. It's all yeah. downhill from here. Uh, rewatchable scenes. I have a controversial take. The first scene is really good. <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> don't me the say idol that. Scene? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That scene's really good. I don't in know. fact, so that's a, that's a little. Another much. one of my controversial takes is I think it's in the running for best opening scene of all time. Yes, the sequence or just like the, the act, whole scene. Yeah, it's right. just an amazing one way of to the start greatest a movie. character introductions ever. Oh my god! Yeah, the first time we see his don't face. don't get to see his face. Don't get to see his face. Don't get to see his face. Can I do? Can I just? Can I mention the Soderbergh thing? Qu yeah, quickly. Quick, quick? Yeah, of course. So Soderbergh a couple of years ago. Steven Soderbergh recut, quote unquote. He basically put up a version of Raiders that's black and white, yeah, with no sound except for the social network score. And he's just like, just watch this movie this way, and you will understand everything that's happening in the movie without any dialogue, without any music, without anything, because they are geniuses in terms of staging, in terms of shooting. If you watch this opening sequence with just the social network music playing in the background, you're just like, I, I know as much about these characters with no dialogue and nothing else and no bird sounds or anything. It's essentially like expert silent filmmaking, and then you put a Lawrence Kasdan screenplay on top of it. It's yeah. wild. But when you watch this scene, it is incredible how much is communicated with like the most amazing visual efficiency. Iconography, too. I mean, yeah. it's like it's pulling from the past and the kind of movies you'd seen in the past, but also making something new. It's the whole thing, and it's so fun. Like, it's just so... F him, at every step of the way almost getting stabbed by spikes in the wall, you know, see, you know, being covered in spiders, you know, reaching to replace the bag and the golden idol. The and then he thinks he did it, and then it turns mm -hmm. out he didn't. Yes. And yeah. There's so many things in here where you're, in, in this movie, where something will happen. I was watching it, and I was like, is this the first time anyone ever did that? And then, like, for the rest of my life, in every action movie, this happens? You know what I mean? Like, I can point them out, but, like, like when Molina is, like, I think the one guy is, like, we're, they'll, they'll kill us and Molina's like if they wanted to kill us we'd already be dead and it's just like that's in 75 action movies <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, is that the first time I don't know but it feels like it just invents all this or stuff. adios senor yes that's just been ripped off <laughs> liberally over and over again it's like oh he turned on him the rope swing's great uh, I just love booby trap Peruvian temples just in general yeah. that's one of my things <laughs> they filmed this in Hawaii by the way booby traps you think booby trap Peruvian temples yeah. maybe uh, the gold boot is great. Kind of looks like the NBA trophy, like a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. The giant ball. The I remember, yeah. I the giant boulder, I, whatever it is. Um, I remember in the trailer or in the commercial, or whatever they tease it for a split second, and it was kind of like the jaws of that. And you think it's coming way later, and it's like, oh, they're gonna just give us this right away. It's so good. Uh, I have no idea. It's one of those. There's a lot of moments in this movie where, like, I don't know how they filmed that. I don't know how they did that. And then when you do the research, you realize like, oh, they just fucking, they did all this. Yeah. And if somebody got hurt, they got hurt. <laughs> Almost it's like whole Joel Embiid in game four of a Washington <laughs> series. It's part of what makes the movie totally frozen in time, but also so effective is it's almost entirely practical. You know, it's all real. That is a giant piece of, I don't know what it's made out of. Yeah, styrofoam. You know, styrofoam yeah, rolling. And then you read the stories about how hard they worked to get the sound right of what the the boulder rolling across the ground should sound like, you know, and it's at mm. first it sounds like a car on gravel and then that wasn't good enough. So then they went into the kitchen and they started messing with kitchen tools and it's people like working really hard to do something that seems really silly. But when you're seven years old and you watch a movie and it captures your imagination, that's just what a boulder sounds yeah, like. Yeah, And when you're 40 years old or whatever, and you're watching it with a, your big screen TV, you're just like, shit still sounds incredible. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's good. This movie was helped. We had that, I had that on watch station best, but the, as like with a lot of these things, as the technology got better and we could go full widescreen, all that stuff was great. Uh, so we have that one. We have the Egypt fight scene. I try to narrow these down. Um, Ford shoots the sword guy. So, and he thinks they killed Marion, but... Uh, so you're going is, just like the Cairo sequence that gets the to Cairo. The whole Cairo sequence. Yeah. Um, 
there's a thing I, I never knew this, and probably you guys did, but how they, he shot that guy because everyone was so sick with dysentery. Ford couldn't do the fight scene. <clears throat> yeah. And they kind of audibled, and he's like, what if I just shoot him instead of— There's behind-the-scenes footage of him, like, they're, they're basically, like, trying to stage, like, him fighting him with the whip. Yeah. And, yeah, they— Yeah, there's some funny stuff with it where, like, also Ford famously hurt his wrist— doing carpentry work on Valerie Harper's house in the 70s right. before he was famous. So all of the fights, there is some finagling where he's like, wouldn't it just be a little easier if I didn't have to train for this fight and I could just shoot this guy? Yeah. And it turns out to be like a classic comedy action movie <laughs> moment. And the poor stuntman, Terry Richards. <laughs> Training for weeks? <laughs> yeah, he spent several weeks practicing sword skills for this extended fight scene it's that tough. never happened. That whole scene's really good. There's also just... A shitload of people in it, and they navigate it oh so well. And you always know where you she are. She falls in the cart, yeah. and they're going around, and all of a sudden, there's a million carts. And it's he's like a flipping Buster over. Keaton sequence. Yeah, totally. It's great. They would not make a scene, in my opinion. They would not make a scene like that. No, anymore. they'd be like the be CGI people. The carriage yeah. that Marianne is in is to jump through the Abu Dhabi skyscraper now, and then go to the moon. That would be fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, look at, but but it's like a good idea. even look at a movie like um the Jake Gyllenhaal movie Prince of Persia, which is ostensibly a similarly like desert set adventure movie. Yeah, it's just all CGI. Yeah. you know, it's these are it's all real people. These are all real carts. Indy finds the Ark. I really narrowed this down. I narrowed it down to seven. You guys can chip okay. in after. Indy finding the Ark. That whole thing and, with the lowering down and the snakes um, and stuff. Yeah. No, no, I'm, this is before when he- Oh, in the map with the staff. First finds yeah, yeah. It, and the light comes out of it. I thought it was like Sam Hinkie with the process. <laughs> like, I feel like that was the same thing when Sam Hinkie realized, I will tank five seasons <laughs> and I will keep getting top three lottery picks. And the light just came out of whatever basketball encyclopedia he was looking at. No? Did Hinkie turn out to be Belloc? <laughs> 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 yeah, Hickey died. Hickey is Katanga. <laughs> halfway through the movie. Uh, I really like that one. The snake pit scene had that as well. The snake pit scene. So in the research, which I fortunately read afterwards, but apparently you can spot the fake snakes. There's lizards. Some of the snakes have ears, which mean they're lizards. But I still really got creeped out with that snake scene. I mean, just, it's all also those just snakes like are uncomfortable. He, they do a very good job of making it be like he's very scared of snakes. Like he mentions it multiple times before he gets to the the well of souls. Uh, I mean, my favorite line reading in the whole movie is when he jumps into the plane at the beginning, and he's like, you know, there's a snake in in, your, in the seat, and he's like, oh, that's my snake Reggie, and he's like, I hate him. Right. <laughs> and that's like perfect character choice because yeah. you know when you show when you see the snakes later, like nothing will torture the. I wonder if snakes that. ever recovered from raiders. You know, funny thing with the Indiana Jones movies: first movie snakes, second movie bugs, third movie rats. There's like a, a yeah, choice there. Yeah, that's All right. Three of them. The rats and the and first the catacombs. did a good job with the rats too. Yeah, yeah. The uh, I left out when uh, Karen Allen the whole fight at her bar and all that stuff. That part is great. Doing could, the shots that could be in there too. Um, the airplane fade in. Uh, I'm sorry. The airplane fight right into the truck chase. For me, the most rewatchable the part of this movie. Minutes, yeah. I love the beginning, and then I love that part. We get bald, bare-knuckle Nazi. Mm -hmm. And blonde that Nazi guy? who refuses to die. Yeah. Yeah. Get those two guys. Yeah, that's actually the weirdly the only part of the movie that um, tempts my suspension of disbelief. Not the Ark of the Covenant coming alive and the spirits. It's like literally when Indy's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with you know, Bruiser Brody there for yeah. a while. It's like <laughs> right. taking haymakers right in the face from this guy. Boom. Yeah. Boom. That actually, I remember that for a while. I can't remember the first movie because that was also like, we're in like 48 hours, like Nolte and Murphy just wail on each other for 30 minutes and then they're like, let's go, let's go back into the bar, you know? Yeah. When's the last time you got hit in the face? It's, it's literally been since like eighth grade. What about you? It's been a long time? It's only like an inadvertent elbow in basketball. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> Probably like 19, but it hurts like a mother, man. Like yeah, these guys are yeah. just taking shots. Yeah. Well, it's like 25th hour when he gets punched five times yeah. and his face is completely Make fucked up out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the last one I have is face melt to Palooza. Oh I just wrote down. Yeah. Um, we don't, we'll never know why they didn't just kill Indy, why they just had him tied up. Standing just far enough away that the, there's some nitpicks there, but um, four or five times was just like just shoot Indiana yeah, Jones. Yeah, I, just I got some him. nitpicks. Yeah, yeah. just kill that. him. Uh, any other uh, rewatchable scenes so, for you? As exposition scenes go, 
when those guys come and visit Marcus and Indy at college, yeah. and Indy's got the big book, and he's like, you guys didn't go to Sunday school, did you? You know, like, that's fucking awesome. Like, that and, whole scene is amazing. And you just sort of like, you know, the music is playing, like, this, the, the Williams score is playing, and it's just like creating this, you know, the world of, like, mysticism and spirituality and religiosity. And then also, like, you know, we focus so much on the action. It's the adventure part, too. It's like, this guy is about to go on this amazing adventure, but you think about how many comic book movies, no, no disrespect, you watch when you're just like, you sit through an explanation of what's going to happen or what's happening, and you're just like, what the fuck are you talking about? What? This actually makes sense. In this movie, it works for a very specific reason, and it's all about the character. The character is a college professor. He's kind of a pedantic jerk. Sure. Yeah. He's somebody who's like, I know everything. I'm going to explain everything to you. So these two FBI agents walk in. FBI agents? I don't I even know so. what they're yeah. supposed to be. Government agents. And he's like, how do you guys not know this? Right. Here's what the Ark of the Covenant is. I'll admit, I did not know what the Ark of the Covenant was until it was explained to me by Indiana Jones. But for that character, it makes sense that he would act that way towards those guys. And it would make sense that he would go to his chalkboard and he would draw how the staff of Ra would then shoot light yeah. into a crystal. And it, the, the coolest thing is like there's a shot of the two guys talking, the two FBI agents talking, but in the foreground of the shot is the book. And the book is like essentially like Indy's trump card. He's like this knowledgeable guy. And that image, that illustration of all that shit coming out of the arc, all the lightning and power of God, it's, it stays with you until the face melt. It's so cool. Really good. Great stuff. I have the opening scene as my most rewatchable scene with the uh, the airplane fight going into the truck chase second. The truck chase just does an awesome, you're constantly going, how do they do this? Yeah. How did how did that happen? Is it the best chase scene in a movie ever? Like, what's that, like four <sighs> minutes long? I feel like it's even longer than that because it it includes all that, you know, it includes him getting on the truck, falling off well, the truck, the getting back first. on the truck, yeah. right? He rides out on the horse. He jumps on. He gets, finally gets control of the, the truck. Then he gets shot in the arm. Yeah. And then the, the I love that one thing I picked up on, which I had not really realized before, but he's on the truck and the one of the German soldiers gets inside the truck with him while he's driving. And the German soldier starts punching him in the arm that he was shot yeah. in. I'm like, this is such a little small choice that is so well done. But I feel like it's longer than four minutes. I feel like it's six Maybe or seven it's like minutes. Eight, yeah. No, it, the, the two, those two, like the fight at the airfield and the truck chase are both like 10 minutes long each. You know how Chris, a recurring theme on the rewatchables is that he really wants to own a bar? <laughs> yes. I really, at some point in my life, want to climb on somebody's car, come in the passenger seat, punch them in the face, and then kick them out of the car <laughs> and take over the steering wheel at like 40 miles an hour. Just once. <laughs> I don't think that those are the same. <laughs> I just want to do it once. I thought just you were to see if like, I can do we it. We should buy Chris a bar in Nepal <laughs> and send him there. And that could be like a bringer bit. There's a lot of mechanics though, right? Because you have to climb through the window, which yeah, that I alone it, is hard. I don't think it works. I don't think anybody can the do it. The guy's driving. All he has to do as you're climbing in is just punch you in the balls, right? So you got to uh -huh. avoid that. You sit down. Then you have to right hand cross the guy in the face reach over, open the door, but now he's his limp body is not driving. So the car is going to lose momentum. So you have to, in the moment, figure out how to keep the gas pedal going, how to open the door, how to get this dude out and take control of the this wheel. This is so funny, though, I because just see we're it. so cr like, crippled by like modern society. I'm like, I can't make a left on Western. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, like, you think I'm going to kick a fucking Nazi out of my car? Well, <laughs> like, it's it's, it's another it. thing, though, that has become so common. I saw Fast and Furious 9 yesterday, mm. and there are so many scenes of guys jumping into and out of the car in that exact oh, same yeah. way, like swinging through the window to get in, and we just accept it. Like, try doing that in your car while parked try jumping later. on somebody's car on the hood when they're going 40 miles an hour like the odds it's of impossible. you would get car, emulsified yeah, you would yeah. Die. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's why in the big show I love when JT Lancer has to oh yeah the cop asks himself. him to jump in the car Barringer. he immediately gets hurt yeah. the steering wheel is going up uh, alright what stage is the best the music yeah the John Williams score yeah. We've, I've, I think we've neglected to like nominate the score in a couple of more recent ones and I just want to say that this is probably my favorite dun, score dun, is dun, it is it dun, dun, dun. so is this his best because I mean this is the Jaws dude is who did best. Jaws and Jaws Star Wars three iconic Jaws pieces is amazing. it's the it's got the, the march the march it's got the the map room music like da, na, na, that one I don't know how does the march go I forget that's what's called the, theme, the march yeah, yeah i just call it the theme um i think great music i like any movie for another what's age the best where somebody says to somebody else what about your boss <laughs> der fuhrer <laughs> 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 
<laughs> We're just in good shape. <laughs> I have a whole thing I want to do about Nazis as millions of movies later. Hold that thought. Uh, another one stage the best. Less than two hours. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's a hundred and like five minutes. And yeah. this really helped it when people are going to see this in the theater because you could show it at five, seven, nine, eleven, whatever you want to do. Uh, Harrison Ford's hat is great. People did. There was a run for this hat in the eighties. So I'm just going to tell you, the fedora. Yeah. When we were talking about Ford and how cool Ford was a little while ago, I wanted to suggest to you guys, like, let's just each of us try to put that hat on and take a photo, see how we look. See if we can pull it off. No, my head's there's, too big. There's no way. No other human being can wear yeah. that hat aside from Humphrey Bogart. Those yeah, are the only right. two people I you've ever like seen wear that. I would Austrian <laughs> tourist on like safari <laughs> if I wore that. No. Morewood Sage the best. Uh, really young Alfred Molina. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's 15 years away from playing Night Ranger for <laughs> Dirk Diggler and Todd Parker. Yes. Beautiful. Reed Rothschild. Yes. With the guy throwing the things, the cracker. When are, so... We did, we did Goodfellas and we're doing Raiders now. These are two of the five most requested oh, movies ever on back. the show. When are we doing the, Boogie Nights? Boogie Nights, we're still saving. Okay. I feel like once Boogie Nights happen, at that point, I don't care about the pot anymore. <laughs> just like, <laughs> now we're just that. playing out the string. <laughs> I'll say that. Bill. Todd <laughs> Parker. <laughs> um, that's I when, love that's the, when me and Winslet take over the feed and just start yeah, talking about the reader. Kate. Yeah. God, she's so good. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Um, the poison date is great. Yeah, uh, I, that is just some awesome filmmaking where the the things in the air and the guy catches it. Bad date. Bad date. Yeah. Look over. You got the dead monkey. I'm sure they killed the monkey. This is back in the days. Oh, we like, we need to kill the monkey. Yeah, stop how they get the monkey stop moving? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more more would say the best. November 1983, Paramount releases 500,000 home video copies of Raiders, priced at 39.95. Priced it way lower than the competition, thinking that it would pr- it would uh, promote home video watching by within two years. One million copies of the film has sold. Became the best selling VHS of the eighties. And there's some good. If you ever read the Disney books, which is a really fun deep dive to mm-hmm. read all the Eisner Iger stuff. The stuff about Eisner unlocking the home video business as part of Disney's whole thing. It's like really, it seems like a no brainer, but it just but wasn't. He would do, wouldn't, was he the person who originated the idea of like, you can buy Beauty and the Beast for two months and yeah. then it's yes. going back in the library for- Oh yeah. Yes. All, the, all the stuff they did was just genius. And th- this was one of the things. Um, so another what's age the best, Paul Freeman mm-hmm. plays Bullock. <laughs> Bullock. Not Reggie Bullock. Not Reggie Bullock. Reggie Bullock. Reggie Bullock. <laughs> Bullock. <laughs> So when the Indian is threatening the Nazis, you can see a fly going into his mouth. And apparently he didn't realize it. Pauline Kale wrote about it in a review, and then it's become this legendary moment from the thing. It's yeah, a it's good the, what's age the best. It's the moment when Indy has the rocket launcher and he's aiming it down at them right near the end before the Belloc, arc yeah. opens up and Belloc is talking and, and he gets the, the gun and he's just like, We all go. Yes. Yeah. All the other what's age the best, like we mentioned at the top, the all the people that are in this, um, Nazis as villains, all all those great things. It's just um, anything else for you guys. Uh, there's a detail in this movie that I remember. I, I've just it stuck with me basically my entire life, and I don't know why they do it. It doesn't really matter, but I love it every single time I see it. Which is the one male student in his class who leaves him an apple as he's the last one to walk <laughs> out, and he's so he's in such a bad mood because obviously, like all the women love him. Yeah. And the student's just like, here's your apple and walks out. And then Marcus picks up the apple and starts eating it. I was just always like, I want an entire, I want to know everything about that kid (laughs) and what's going on with him. But that's like these little details that are in this movie that aren't in other movies. Other things that have aged the best. uh, Karen Allen going cruising, followed by Raiders of the Lost Ark. Incredible moment. Wow. You see cruising's on the Criterion channel? Did you know that? Seriously? Yeah. It got added. It's huge for you both. It's it's time for us to really come out this summer, you know? I think that people yeah, want it. Is. it. <laughs> is it just the two of us for that one? Of course it is. I'm Who not do you want to have on cruising? I'm not on that pod. Cruising. Are you are you mad because you movie. weren't invited? Do you want to be invited? I had uh, <laughs> I, do, I I wish you and Craig luck. I had one more uh what's <laughs> I'm gonna do cruising solo like I did castaway. It's just gonna <laughs> oh be God. me by myself. Chris is gonna come in at the end and all chaps. <laughs> just only for the dark web. Um I had one more would say the best because airplanes the year before this airplane has the shot when they have the flashback scene and they're in that bar when it's like the Saturday night favorite thing. And it's just this bar in the middle of nowhere. I, 
I do feel like this is a good run for bars in the middle of nowhere. Karen Allen's bar is, I have no idea where, where was that supposed to be? Nepal. 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 Yeah. Um, just like a cool place to hang. I don't know. They did a nice job with like random island location bars back in the early eighties. Did were you inspired at all seeing that bar and thinking like this is this is kind of similar to my? Well, I got I gotta say, shrimp the, and sports. That bar, CR shrimp and sports. Her her, her, her I mean, CR shrimp and sports. Still looking for investors, but uh, <laughs> looking for an A round. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of like real estate. Have you like, considered a SPAC with the athletic? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Karen Allen's drinking game in the beginning reminded me of my 24th birthday, where you just go shot for shot with a Sherpa. Yeah. To, you know. That was you? <laughs> yeah. That was my 50th birthday, and I lost, like, much like the Sherpa. Uh, what's age the worst? I, I have a whole, well, let's do this now. The Indiana Jones marrying chemistry. It's a little so wait, lacking. What are you are you saying specifically the, the 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 sparks between them or just the dynamic of her being like I was a child when you started? No, I'm talking about the sparks. I'm never buying them as a couple. I don't think he really cares that much about her. I think he's in love with the concept of getting the ark. And they're trying to get us to buy this whole storyline with her. And quite frankly, I never totally bought it. And I quite think it's frankly. the biggest flaw of the movie. Well, but so I, I think you're right that there's this sense that he is selfish and he's putting the quest over the girl, but that plays out in later films. I mean, he has a different love interest in every movie and there's a sense that he has a hard time committing. This isn't really something he's very interested in as a romantic partner. He's interested in going on adventures. And so in the fourth movie, they actually kind of address this because they introduce, you know, Marion comes back and then they introduce his son mm. who's played by Shia LaBeouf. Well, and the fourth movie sucked. So it, it all made sense. It's not good. Um, but I, I still think Karen Allen is really good, though. I, and I think, like, her okay. hard-nosed approach to him is the right one. And the one that works the best for me. Like, I in the second film, I really don't think that the female Kate Capshaw. lead is, is really up to snuff. Steve liked her. <laughs> he, he did. Steve and he married like, her. I, I know I just got married, but I think I'm going to step in. <laughs> and the third one is bizarre. The third one Allison is like, duty? Yeah, yeah, is is a is a, a, a Nazi. Yeah, <laughs> was yeah. hot for him and hot for her, her his, dad. His dad too. Yeah. yeah, his dad. Yeah, that one probably would. They probably would have gone a different direction with the hot Nazi. At that point, you're just like, no, no, it's Steve. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> you want to do, you want to make another indie movie. He's like, no, 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 it's a hot Nazi. It's like, all right. Um, the uh, I'll have more on Karen Allen when we get to the okay. recasting couch. Mm -hmm. More would say it's the worst. I can't believe the original name for Indiana Jones was Indiana Smith, and Lucas rolled with that for like four years. What a fucking lame name, Indiana Smith. Well, this, the story was that it was too close to Nevada Smith, the Steve McQueen movie, so they, that was the reason they changed it. Not because it sounds bad. But Indiana Jones, I mean, in the history of perfect character names, yeah, amazing. Uh, more would say the worst. Karen Allen did a lot of bitching about this movie after that they didn't listen to some of her ideas and they want she wanted more of a backstory with all this. It's like shut up, you got to be in Raiders of the Lost Ark. There is like apparently that bar scene in, in Nepal is like it has a lot more dialogue. Kazan said like I wrote that's like my favorite piece of writing is the scene between Indy and Marion and they just cut like everything out but the beginning and the end. So I had that. Um, he named Marion after his wife's grandmother. He said he really cared about, he called it comedy character stuff, Cary Grant, Gene Arthur. And he said that's about three times as much that didn't get used. They simplifies the whole thing. But he said, when I look at the movie now, I think they were right. So they stripped it down. And Karen Allen was still mad about it. It's like, well, you still got to be in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're fine. Yeah, I, I don't know that you need it necessarily. I guess Did the you first get profit participation in Raiders of the Lost Ark? Probably, Probably not. not. The first cut was like three plus hours. Yeah. So I imagine a lot of it was in that first cut, but. The movie works as is. I don't know whether to put the special effects in what's age the best or what's age the worst. Because the face melt thing's pretty good. Yeah. But at the same time, I think... The ghosts, maybe? Nowadays, yeah. yeah. The ghosts are pretty rough. The the plane traveling with the red line on a cheesy map, which is basically like we didn't have enough budget to film a travel <laughs> sequence. Let's just pull a map out with a red line and I, call I it a day. I don't need to see a lot of takeoffs and landings yeah. of planes, though. That's fine with me. Where do you stand on evil-looking lead Nazi in glasses guy? Tot? Tot. Uh, I mean, he definitely does everything he's asked to do. Be Sean? A, be an asshole and then die. I think he's so visually compelling and scary that I he actually... I don't actually know what he does that is so bad. 
Like, what is it that he... Are you zagging? No, no, no. It's, I, obviously, I, he, I'm with him. I'm, obviously, I'm he's a Nazi, so yeah. Yeah. he's evil. But, like, why is he a villain? But, like, why is he the arch villain I of think the he's story? supposed to bring with him, like, the weight of the Gestapo and, like, all right. of the, like, other... Like, if, like if Chris wore those glasses, would he be evil? Like, is, it's like the glasses were all that made him evil. He, he he'd, sweats he'd, profusely and wears a black leather overcoat. I needed him to kill a couple people in front of us. Very similar energy, I think, to the Cardinal with International oh, Mobilare. Yeah. He you does know, have, a he does bit have of that kind of that. I have a great take, and this is probably my best take of the entire, entire podcast. Okay. I don't think they put a lot of thought into putting like awesome actors in roles like that. I think that was where they looked I, at I, it I, and well, they thought, to your point, let's save I don't some money. think that in 1981, people were like, I really need to play a Nazi. I mean, Olivier does it in Marathon Man, but like- Yeah, and guess what? He was fucking awesome. Sure. But I don't think until we get to Die Hard where somebody's like, oh, actually the villain part- Is good, right. Is an awesome part. And then Nicholson's like, I'm going to be the Joker. And people are like, whoa, Nicholson's going to be the Joker? Because this was an era where the actors wanted to play the good guy parts. Right. They didn't want to be the bad guy. And so you end up with like the actor like Tot, who's like fine, but I was watching Don't Ask Why, but I was watching Blowout with Travolta. The, Don't ask our, why. Our De Palma Scorsese conversation. I've just I've been re-examining De Palma a little bit. Yeah, and Lithgow has this amazing kind of under the radar villain run in that where he barely does anything, but he's fucking awesome. And I just think if that's like a mediocre actor, that movie is a different movie. And I think they fucked up with Todd. I, I think he looks the part. I think to me, it's more like in the writing of the story, we don't totally see what he, what makes him the arch villain. You know, like he's going after Marion, but basically he gets defeated by Indy in that first sequence. And then later we see him when he comes into the tent and he takes his jacket off and then he takes out what the looks like he, he's yeah. going to choke someone with something. And then it turns into a hanger and he hangs his coat on it. And it, I think it's meant to indicate that like the Nazis were clowns. You know, the movie is is showing you that like they believe in the occult, but they don't really know, like they're, they're bumbling and it's meant to make them look foolish. And that's part of the thinking there. Same thing, Wolf Collar, who the... Uh, Colonel Dietrich is like kind of a buffoon. Yeah, he's the, the other big like Nazi. To his music when everything explodes towards the I think end. Todd, yeah. All I said it was like kick a dog, kick mm. a monkey, do something that's like, oh, this is a bad. He never, never has really, that moment. I gotta admit, I'd, I'd never really gotten through this film and been like, Todd's not intimidating enough. I think Belloc is the real villain in the movie, though. And Belloc is interesting, and he's a, a symptom of maybe something that has kind of quote unquote aged the worst, which is like. Anytime there's a character who is not English or American, they're like, let's cast a, cast a British guy. <laughs> like, Paul Freeman is British. He's not French. <laughs> right. The same way that Jonathan Rhys Davies plays a guy named Sala. The same same way that um, Alfred Molina yep. plays a guy, a Peruvian guide. It's like, they're just casting British actors, which is something that obviously had been happening in Hollywood for years and years. I had Paul Freeman in What's Age the Worst. I mean, his career since this movie kind of speaks for itself. That's a part that should have gone to an awesome actor. Like so, Dirk Bogart or something? It, like, like David it, Strathairn 10 years Strathairn, later. Yeah. That kind, At least somebody of that caliber. I read Giancarlo Giannini was mm -hmm. was oh. tabbed for it. Who And he would have been good. They would have had to make the character Italian and not French. But it being a French character is smart. Because that you know he's the mealy mouthed middle ground World War II Yeah, it's French like the guy who's a collaborator, yeah. Yes. Can I just say one more what's his worst? Could Hackman have been there as a French guy? <laughs> I don't know. Imagine but, you know, Hackman like, doing these, a French remember accent. Remember all those, like the, the Al Pacino conversation at Musso and Frank in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where like they're they're thinking about how they're being perceived. Like major movie stars weren't, like you're saying, not doing villain parts. Hackman is taught. Oh. <laughs> Put some glasses on him. <laughs> what about Hackman as Indy? Because that's really where he that was That was at. a rumor, right? That he was asked. I have a couple more Wood Sage the Worst, but you want to go? Yeah. I one? just was going to say I hate the monkey. Yeah, I don't like, I never have liked my, monkeys. Up there with Marcel and Friends is my least favorite Friends monkey. Friends is, the, that's the number one worst monkey. Yeah. Does this monkey is like, so this monkey is like an undercover cop? Like, you can trade a monkey to do that? Like, how, how does that work? <laughs> Season one of Friends is actually excellent, and Marcel the monkey is the fucking turd in the punch bowl right. of half of that You're season. absolutely right. Just a terrible, when terrible When you're right, idea. you're right. That's your best take. Thank you. I knew I'd have a good take today. <laughs> you guys are all uh, More would say the worst. <laughs> the sequel. Ooh. Yeah, people hated the sequel. It made so much money, and everybody was upset after. And it was like, it's kind of, it was what thirty years before Twitter, twenty five years before Twitter. But it was like if America just could have been Twitter, everybody was on. like, that movie fucking sucked. People were so mad the the whole summer, and it was violent. It ends up PG thirteen like has kids to happen. Getting killed, yeah, yeah, it was rough. There, it's 
It's the, a weird fucking the, movie. The biggest sin, in addition to it being like crazy insensitive in a movie that can never be made now, it's totally lost the tone of Indiana Jones. It's so slapsticky. Yeah. Indy is so cool in the first movie. And there are jokes and there's a lot of smart lines, but it's a rollicking adventure movie. <coughs> and Temple of Doom is like a clown show. Almost literally at times, it feels like a circus. And they get it back in, in Last Crusade. But it's bizarre how they just kind of like, I mean, a lot of the same people worked on that movie. Different screenwriters, no Kasdan. That's yeah. important. But it's it's weird how how much they lost the plot. Was that 84 or 85? Because there's so many- 84. So many great pop culture movies came out, 84, 85, and that one just didn't fit in with the rest of them. Uh, Pauline Kael mentioned her review. I would put it more in the what's age the worst, just that she didn't see. I know, it sounds like she was right. It was, but I, I the thing that was great about her was she could straddle the fence and point out all the things, but also like admire what the person achieved and it's not in there in this movie. At the same time, it's an incredible review. Um, the last what's age the worst for me is I don't know why they cut the Playboy stuff because initially when Brody goes to uh, Indy's house to discuss the mission, Jones is dressed the way he is because he has a young woman in the bedroom. They decide to cut it. Um, the initial idea was to make him a little more James Bondy and then Spielberg's like, nah, it doesn't really fit his character. I just didn't think that was a mistake. I think if Indy had been slightly more of a playboy, I would have just enjoyed that. It's just a little dicey because it makes it sound like he was just into teenage girls. I mean, the whole movie is like the girls in his class mm -hmm. are swooning after him. So it's like if you had gone too far in that direction, I think it would have seemed way out of touch. Although, you know, in 1936, when the movie is set, it's not so bizarre to imagine a college professor romancing his students. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I think he's good enough as a romantic yeah, lead. Yeah, I think it's actually... Professor and Jones canceled. It also, canceled. it's like, this is ultimately like a PG movie, you know? Yeah. And uh, like, there's, there is like, I guess a love scene with Marion later on. It makes that love scene more pure because he hasn't been with anybody else that you've seen, you know? I don't think they consummated it. All right, casting what ifs. So Coffin was supposed to direct this film. He's like, I can't, I'm doing something called The Outlaw Josie Wales. I'm just going to work on that. So I can't do that for you. Until he wasn't. And then he wasn't. Lucas wanted Deborah Winger. Wasn't interested. She said no. Said no. <laughs> Spielberg wanted Amy Irving, his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. She wasn't available. They kicked the tires on Barbara Hershey and Sean Young. They used Sean Young for the screen test for all the indie auditions, which you can see in the DVD extras. Um, and she had enough chemistry with Ford that they ended up in Blade Runner together. So... They eventually landed on Karen Allen, who they liked in Animal House. Indiana Jones. This gets interesting. So there's a lot of Jeff Bridges stuff out there. Mm -hmm. It turns out he was not offered the movie, but the casting director did like Jeff Bridges. And they, had, they had done an audition with him. Like he had come out and like hung out. And Gotta say, Jeff Bridges would have been good. I don't think he would have been good as Harrison Ford, but I, I think that's a solid consolation prize. I've been trying to picture it. I like I Jeff Bridges more than you. Yeah, I I like him a lot. I uh, I, I feel like you're not you're not invited when we have the Jeff Bridges parties. Do you think Jeff Bridges is too weird to be Indy? He would have done like the vanishing crossed with <laughs> Indiana Jones. If Gosh. Jeff Bridges had been Indy, would you have been like Indiana Jones taught me it was okay to be weird? <laughs> <laughs> Drink the coffee, <laughs> Jeff. Guys, Jeff Bridges is not weird. I don't know what to tell you. You don't think Jeff Bridges is like Jeff Bridges gets weird? Starman weird. That is pretty weird. The vanishing actually. Yeah. Starman is pretty he'll, weird. He'll get, yeah. he'll get his fucking weird on. He's pretty weird and fearless. He's out yeah. there. You know? he, he'll he'll go for it. Are you guys like part of some Jeff Bridges secret? Well, I, 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 Jeff what's Bridges. happening? We both I love like Jeff, Jeff Bridges. Bridges. You're yeah. the one who has like Jeff Bridges. Listen, you're not invited to our Jeff Bridges <laughs> text. We talk about how good the first twenty minutes of Against All Odds is. We're not inviting you. You think? Do you think when the the listeners of this show hear you guys talking like this about how like I'm not invited because you're part of some Jeff Bridges <laughs> society? They're like, this is normal. These guys are pretty cool. They're definitely These, doing cool just stuff. Two guys who love talking about cruising and Jeff Bridges yeah, sick. We, and not letting Sean in. Everyone's got their quirks. Uh, um, I love Jeff Bridges. I don't know how he got here. Wait, so what did yeah, you do? You, you, you wanted some thought. What did he you He would have been a good indie. I was thinking about it when I rewatched the movie because I had read that he was. I, was it Lucas who wanted him the most or Spielberg? I can't remember. It was the casting director. Casting director. Um, but he does not have that like hard nosed thing that Harrison Ford has, where Harrison Ford throws a punch and you're like, wow. He actually hit that giant Nazi wrestler guy, and maybe yeah. he hurt him. And Bridges, I don't think, has that. Okay. Lucas's wife preferred Tom Selleck, planted that bug. They got excited about it. And Tom Selleck was going to be <laughs> going to be indie. Yeah. 
And he was filming a show called Magnum P.I. And they asked CBS to release him a little early from the contract. And CBS was like, wait, they want Tom Selleck. We must be on to something. They green light Magnum P.I. And Tom Selleck loses Indiana Jones. They had fit him for the costume. He was going to wear the mustache in the movie. It was happening. So then there's a writer's strike. Mm -hmm. Or an actor's strike? An actor's strike. Writer's strike. Writer's strike. Writer's strike. And he could have done it. And he could have done it. Yeah. But they had chosen Ford by then. They had already picked Is Ford. it the greatest sliding doors moment in the history of movies? It's really good. Well, and like, I still have, have to ask Boogie yourself, Nights like, just for me personally. Yeah. But like that, that run that Ford goes on after Raiders, say like one or two of those movies are going to happen either way. But, you know, like is Tom Selleck Dr. Richard Kimball in 20, 20 years after that? Here's the, here's the thing. I love Tom. Tom Selleck. Selleck is awesome. Yeah, I, like it's kind of sad because he's real. I've never watched him in something and been like, "This isn't good." I've always enjoyed him. Don't feel bad for Tom Selleck. Yeah. he made like seven hundred million dollars at Magnum PI yeah. and lives in and Hawaii. Blue and I am blue blood. Hundred million dollar for like fifteen yeah, now years he's on and blue like everybody's mom watches he's, every episode. He's just not an icon of movies, and he could have been in this movie. I don't. I don't know if he totally has. He doesn't have the exact stuff that Harrison well, Ford has. I think also. Did he ever try to do something? Didn't he try to do something kind of like this then? Like a couple yeah. years later? It, was, it, it like, failed. It was like Alan Quartermain or something like that. Was like he in that one? He was in that one. Is no. that Richard Chamberlain? He, I can't. Yeah. He, he was in one of those type of things. Yeah. It didn't happen. Uh, well, there's there's Mr. Baseball, one of your favorites. <laughs> well, he was Monica's boyfriend in Friends, which was a great character. That's true. The older older man boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Market corrected really good, Marcel. Yeah. But yeah, he's not on Friends because he would have been an A plus list movie star. Right. Was it Quigley Down Under? Yeah. Was that yeah, what he did? That's it. That was it. Yeah. yeah. And America said no thanks. <laughs> um, so Spielberg, Spielberg's like, let's get Ford. Lucas is like, eh, I don't want to seem like Ford's my guy. I don't want a Scorsese De Niro situation. Yeah, Meanwhile, God like, forbid. Terrible take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, George, Lu George Lucas, are we sure he was good? Yeah. I don't know. Um, Ford's like, cool, I'll do it. Seven-figure salary, percentage of the gross profits. And the option to rewrite his dialogue, which he didn't do because he was too stoned. So there's a pretty cool hour-long doc on the Blu-ray of this where you see a lot of clips of them making this movie. Yeah, And you can see that Harrison Ford has a lot of influence. A lot of questions. A lot of pressuring Spielberg to explain why they're doing something a certain way. Mm -hmm. Prickly guy, that Harrison Ford. A lot of opinions, but he seems very smart. He seems like he's asking the right questions. You can, there's a there, online you can. There's versions of like screenplays with his notes in the margins, and they're really they're pretty. pretty Was right. there a moment on any of the documentary when Spielberg just gets mad and he's like, "You were working with a fucking ape <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> now you're questioning me." One of the, that's something that is revealed, and you know these. This is an edited. You were documentary. Valerie Harper's carpenter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he Spielberg is exactly what how they how they describe him on the set. Yeah. Enthusiastic, yeah. engaged, excited to talk to every actor, knows everything he wants, communicates clearly, never less than a smile on his face. Like, there's a reason he has the reputation he has because he's like, I just fucking love making movies. Yeah. DeVito was supposed to play Sala. That Basically, cool. he does in Romancing the Stone, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, had scheduling conflicts with Taxi, a great show. TV, man. Really getting in the way of Raiders of the Lost Ark casting. And then his agent's like, we can make those go away. Give us a lot of money. And they're like, cool. We'll just hire no name. Um, Klaus Kinski was offered the role of, of Tot, a Bill Hader favorite, Klaus Kinski. That would have been better because Klaus Kinski is terrifying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also huge. And Tot is like 5'6". And Klaus Kinski is like 6'2". It's even worse I heard, I just because... I never expected you guys to, to just be so anti-Tot in this movie. Tot. Not like pro tot. Tot but, you sucked. Know. I'm still recovering from the Jeff Bridges Society. I don't. You know, you guys, we're surprising each other here. <laughs> That's between me and Chris. <laughs> Klaus Kinski said, um, "I don't love the script. I'm going to appear in the horror film Venom because they're offering me more money." Mm. Bad call by Klaus. Klaus could have lived on for so eternity. Tot, tot, obviously a one and done. You know, he's not. He's not coming back for sequels. You yeah. know, Klaus. He's in a gear a wrath of God. He's in Fitzcarraldo. He's going to be all right. There's a documentary called Dangerous Days, Making Blade Runner, 2007, where apparently um, there were excerpts in the cinemas for the trailers that convinced the guys in Blade Runner to get Harrison Ford to play Rick. Who knows if that's true? Also, if you if you look at 
Indiana Jones, very much inspired by Bogart's character in Treasure of Sierra Madre, Mm -hmm. Blade Runner, very much inspired by like the to have and have not style Bogart detective characters. Like he's he kind of picks up the Bogart mantle in a way. Jonathan Price was considered for Belloc, Mm. and then they did Paul. That would have been good. He would have been good too. That would have been good. Um, yeah, the the Sella Harrison Ford is in the pantheon of movie what ifs. I still have DiCaprio picking Titanic over Boogie Nights as number one. Well, that because they, they, that's like an so exploding universe. Like yeah, they're, 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 yeah, a bunch of shit goes down. Do you have Kate Winslet on your podcast twice? Who can say? Maybe you have. Maybe she's Greenwald. Maybe she's your co-host. <laughs> you know, like think of how things could have shaken out. What did Paul Thomas Anderson tell us when he came on my podcast? I, I'm not. <laughs> what did? What did, what did he tell us about the DiCaprio thing that he might have had the wrong energy? You're getting competitive with Chris is really good. Yes. I want to keep this going. <laughs> Kate Winslet. You had Chris right Bosch this week. It's a schism yeah. in, the, in the Jeff Bridges text message thread. <laughs> well, Chris, we'll work it out. Okay. We're fine. Yeah. I, I'm not worried about us. Wait, what did PTA say? Didn't he say he he thinks it actually worked out better that they had Wahlberg? He told him we did a whole thing with him on the yeah. pod we did. I mean, it did. He said Leo, in retrospect, might, might have been too youthful. But I... Do you want Leo to be Dirk? Wahlberg is perfect as Dirk because he's just a little dim. You need this kid to be a little dim for it to work. It would have been really good. Stepping on Boogie Nights. We'll talk about it. Yeah, I don't want to step on the Boogie Nights podcast, especially when, I mean, that might, that'll that be the longest pod we ever do on this. You think so? That'll be four and a half hours. Yeah, Diggler-esque. <laughs> I could do 20 minutes just on Roller Girl always wearing her skates that, that's no matter where she was. That's going to be the game where we have to load manage you going into that. You know what I mean? Take me out. Do film it in two parts. You're going to have yeah. your own doctors work, in your, work on your quads. Uh, best That Guy, aka the Joey Pants Award. So Paul Freeman probably wins for Belloc because I don't even I didn't even know that was his name. I got to be honest. I just knew him as Belloc. Uh, and Ronald Lacey was taught. I didn't know either of those names, and I've watched this movie for forty years. So John Reese, I had no idea John what those Reese guys Davies were is too big for. I feel like he pants. was John Reese Davies. Okay, I think he is because of the Lord of the Rings movies. Okay, who do you have for the Vincent Hanna Give Me All You Got Award for overacting? I have Molina and Karen Allen. I have Karen Allen. Karen, Karen Allen's in fifth gear pretty much from the second she does eleven shots in Nepal, and then is just like changing dresses every five seconds. Throughout She's the really movie. going for yeah. it. Yeah. This is going to seem a little weird, but I feel like Denholm Elliott has a little bit of like, stop trying to interrupt indie energy yeah. in some of the scenes where it's like, I know yeah. that's how it's written, but like Denholm Elliott tries to explain stuff to people. And it's like, yo, we got Indiana Jones here. Like <laughs> right. Marcus, just stand down. Like let, let Indy explain that's everything. He, and he does a lot in Crusade. He gets gets real involved. Yes. Yeah. And he's, by that point, Denholm Elliott's like 80. Yeah. Who do you have for the Jed Nelson award for the guy who, or girl who seems like they're in a completely different movie? I couldn't I feel like everybody was in this movie. The Sherpa. The Sherpa's like in, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe the Sherpa. We'll go with him. What about Katanga? Where it's like He's kind of in a James Bond movie a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Dion Waiters Award. The nominees are the Eyelid student. Mm-hmm. She just makes a half court three and then we never see her again. <laughs> That's right. The Flip Murray. <laughs> yeah. Bald bare knuckle Nazi guy who's oh, yeah. killed twice in the film. His uh-huh. name was Pat Roach, burly British wrestler. Um, he's a giant Sherpa. He dies in the bar and then he dies again in, as the German mechanic. Um, other than that, I, I, I have Mr. Katanga for this. I okay. think he brings a lot of energy. Yeah. What about the Cairo swordsman? I have for that. That's pretty good. I would like to nominate him for a new award, which is the reverse Dion waiters for the guy who does the least with the most, AKA the Jimmy Butler, <laughs> because that guy has the drop on Indy does all this talking and gets swept by the bucks. <laughs> that's pretty good I like that one it's a lot the of Jimmy Butler award I'm not mad at all there's a lot of Sixers pain coming through the in that Jimmy new Butler award good. Yeah. I like that the guy who talks the most shit gets swept <laughs> recasting couch I have a bronze silver and gold medalist okay um, bronze medalist anyone over Paul Freeman silver medalist John Lithgow is evil Nazi guy which I as taught as taught okay Karen Allen you're not gonna like this Jeff Bridges. Sharon Stone. Kathleen Turner. I mean, obviously. She does do it. Yeah, she does it in romancing. We're getting her three years earlier. We're jumping the gun on romance in the stone. We're getting her body heat, Kathleen Turner. Mm -hmm. I want to feel like Indiana, that he has such a connection 
with this smoldering batch of sexual energy that he's going to risk everything to save her at all times. Who's, but he and I don't feel like he has that with Karen Allen. But that character doesn't have that. The character is like, show me the arc. Show me the arc that had the tablets. That's what he wants. That's what he wants to fuck. He wants to fuck the arc. He doesn't want to fuck the girl. <laughs> all right, how about <laughs> <Someone>. Michelle Pfeiffer? <laughs> Pretty young then, right? How old is she? Grease 2, Michelle Pfeiffer. Okay. Post Scarface, right? Scarface 83. What oh, about 83. what about any anybody from Big Chill? Like Joe Beth Williams? No, I had the other one. I don't know. Mayor Winningham? The Big Chill? She's no, I she's in Big Chill. Big no. Chill? No. She's insane almost fire. Here's the one. Oh, Get your generational right. movies wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Here's the one they should have picked. I don't not a bigger name than Karen Allen, but Margot Kidder, I think, would have been would have had that would have been a busy year. She yeah. looks so much like Karen Allen. Yeah, I like they, Karen Allen. But you can't have Margot Cater because of the Superman 2 thing. But I think mm -hmm. she could have been good as as this. I just was never totally... What, uh, what about Jeff Bridges as the romantic Jeff Bridges lead? with a wig, I don't think so. Half Fast Internet Research. Um, Lucas got one million, between one million and four million plus a share of the gross profits, which turned out to basically fund everything he wanted to do for the next 40 years. Spielberg got 1.5 million as director and a share of the gross profits. The as Lucas well. thing is so funny because it was all, the the threat has always been like George is going to go back and make his art films, and it's like he's never done it. He just like did three Star Wars movies that people have mixed feelings about, and then sold that for like a bill. And has he made another movie? Other is he done? I, I mean, he he saw Red Tails to the finish line. I see, yeah. That was one of his passion projects, but. No, I mean, like I said, he's like, it, you You pointed it out. He's amazing at putting people together. That's his skill. And terrible at shaving a correct beard. <laughs> I mean, one of the worst beards of all time. I would say maybe even the number neck one. Part? But what's underneath I, the beard is the question. We I, don't know. I, I, just so fucking weird. Just grow, put some more on your neck. Yeah. Um, the script described the opening of the arc as all hell breaks loose. And that was all they had. And then That's they great. did special effects. I still feel like Kathleen Turner. I don't feel like you guys. I think you Rosillo no sold me on that one. <laughs> This is your thing now where it's like if you, if if anybody just blinks when you I have a take, The movie's you, better with Kathleen Turner. Okay. <laughs> She's a bigger star. <laughs> I would have rather seen her on the big screen and I'm just more into it. You guys got, got to keep things together for the Whatever. <laughs> I don't I, I you really got to patch it up. Whatever. I, <laughs> don't get <laughs> whatever. mad. No, nah, whatever. <laughs> I, I okay, if you want me to engage with this, I no, think whatever. my number one draft pick for that would have been Winger. I think Karen Allen's Winger would have been great. And then Kathleen Turner, it's almost like I don't really know what to say because we just get that in Romancing the Stone. So what what what's the Wait, what about like, this? Yeah. Diane Keaton doing K from Godfather. <laughs> no. I'd let her die in the first half hour. It was an abortion, Indy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Should I start doing Keaton in yeah, all of our yeah. pods? Yeah, that seems yeah. reasonable. That line in particular. <laughs> every pod. Yeah, we're, let's yeah. work it all of them. Just do Moneyball again. It was an abortion, it's Billy Bean. No end. <laughs> I would um, never bring something as unholy as the Ark. That was a great scene. Uh, Tunisia was used to portray Egypt. Everybody seems to agree this was maybe the worst filming experience of all time. It was 130 degrees. Basically, the entire crew became sick with dysentery, including Harrison Ford. Spielberg did not get sick because he brought SpaghettiOs and just ate SpaghettiOs and refused to eat the food. Elite. Absolute genius. I can see great Sean job. doing that. Yep, more than Alpha. Love it. <laughs> You can see just me, like, I, I, all I'm doing is eating Mike and Ike's <laughs> over, over. for an it's entire- Mike and Ike's and spaghetti. I'm yeah. not shitting myself all day. <laughs> the uh, the scene when the monkey executed the Hail Hitler salute took 50 takes. Fine. Finally, they had a grape attached to a fishing line <laughs> held just out of reach so the camera could get him to salute. Um, it was so hot in Tunisia that they ran out of stuntmen, which is how Frank Marshall ended up being the pilot. Mm. Mm. And they asked him to do it for a couple hours, but it was really for three days. And the <laughs> cockpit was like 150 degrees. And he said he almost died. <laughs> so um, there you go. They, there's stock footage in this movie. They used um, the DC-3 flying over the Himalayans was used from a movie called Lost Horizon. Um, they used the 1930s street scene from a movie called The Hindenburg because they were just trying to save money to get to the 20 million. Spielberg was obsessed with the post-1941, I need to save money. The canyon where Indy threatens to blow up the arc is the same one where the Jawas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. take on R two D two in Star Wars. That tells you how many times I've seen you Star know, Wars. That you're I like, is this written right? Jawas? Tunisia is famously Tatooine, which is where Luke yeah. grows up. Yeah. R two 
D2, D2 and C3PO uh, and the hieroglyphics. It's like you're, you're, you're reading no, Hungarian no, 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 no. or something. <laughs> like he's the most famous robots in the history of movies. Yeah, whatever. And in Doom, like, doesn't it like the Obi-Wan theaters like in the background in yes, Doom? Yes, yeah. that's a callback. Yeah. R2-D2? R2 D2? <laughs> Indy's bullwhip was sold in December 1999 at Christie's Auction House in London. Do you want to guess the price? CR, you bought it, right? So what did it go for? Uh, it was a private private purchase for private use. No, I don't, I don't know. I'm, uh, $2 million. $43,000. Okay. This made me mad. What a, what a deal. Well, because now at the what NFT great, that's market, it would be million. much higher. Yeah. yeah. Like, what the fuck? How does somebody not go to like 50? Let's call Gio from Sports Card Nonsense. <laughs> yeah, what does he I think? I believe that. that. The jacket and hat are in the Smithsonian. Um, oh, the set of the Well of Souls was also the hotel room set where Jack Nicholson did all his writing in The Shining. Oh my God. That blew my so mind. that's the the one half fest internet research I wanted to mention was so they shot this in the same sound stages where Kubrick worked a lot. Yeah. And Vivian Kubrick, his daughter, got very upset over the treatment of snakes on the set. Oh, wow. And and halted production on Raiders of the Lost Ark for like multiple days to demand like handlers. I remember, and she went on Twitter and was going nuts. Yeah, that's right. She was like, thread. <laughs> Some of you aren't ready for this conversation. <laughs> About snakes in the set of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> I don't have a joke. Uh, Asps, very dangerous. You go first. <laughs> Ford did his own stunts, which every time we do one of these... I just love when the guy does his own stunts. What does that mean, though? Because there's some stuff in this movie that, like... He did his own stunts. He bruised his ribs getting dragged behind the truck. He tore a knee ligament when the plane in the fight scene mm -hmm. with the bald German rolled over his left knee. The crew had to come in and lift oh my God. the thing up. And fortunately, he was in some sand, so he... It, but he should have like crushed his Do leg. Do you think that uh, Ford was like AD, where he just like rolled around on the ground for a while, like grabbing <laughs> his leg before he like... So no, I th I think he was more like I'm trying to think of what basketball player is just playing with seven injuries all the time. I mean, Chris Paul has no cartilage. Yeah, he's, he's more like yeah. a Chris Paul. Like yeah. I'm fine, and his shoulders like hanging off. When they're making this movie, Ford was 38, turning 39. Yeah, which is the exact age I am right now. Yeah. How much of this movie do you think you could do? Mm. Pre-pandemic, let's give you like your your pre-pandemic fitness levels. When I was really fit, you mean? Well, like before, like you could go to the gym. Um, I mean, none of it. That's the thing. It's like him swinging, holding onto a rope tied to a back of a truck. Yeah. This is some incredible late stage career physical work. Great athlete. Great athlete. I think inspired Tom Cruise to ultimately break his ankle on the set of one of those yeah. Mission Impossible movies. Sean, when you're leaving today, I'm going to jump on the side of your car, go <laughs> through the window. <laughs> Punch you, and push you out of the car. Shoot me in the arm first. I just want to punch try my it. arm. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you could do. I mean, you talk like you can't make that happen for yourself. I'm too old. Ten years ago, I think I could have done it. <laughs> the uh, the fight between Indy and the German was largely improvised, and Spielberg apparently was delirious, coming up with more and more ideas for it, and they had to like rein him in because he was the just, mustache guy. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. How was that guy getting shredded to pieces by a? a Plane in a PG movie, and how does he not feel the propeller? Like, because that, th if you're looking at him. like The Exorcist, is the far reaches of what they were willing to put up in a movie theater, and they've got like the Reagan scenes in Mex Exorcist, like getting shredded by propeller is like light work. We need you as the head of the MPAA. I know. I think. You know, what, think of the absolutely depraved nonsense we can get in G-rated movies when you're in charge. <laughs> they based Indy's outfit, flying jacket, and fedora on Charlton Heston's In Secret of the Incas, mm. 1954 movie. Deep cut. So, Never yeah. seen that one. Uh, Apex Mountain. Ford. I would I would say yes. It has to be yes, right? Right. Uh, an Apex Mountain that He's lasts He's in the middle of the decades. Star Wars yeah. trilogy, and then he has this, with Blade Runner coming... And that's it. We're off. He can do whatever movie he wants after this. Regarding Henry? <laughs> <laughs> no? Uh, I don't know. I... Craig, do you know what regarding Henry was? Harrison Ford is like this asshole. Yeah. But he gets shot in the head and becomes brain damaged, but it makes him a nicer and person. for like a year, Premier Magazine plot. was like, regarding Henry is coming. This is going to be like the greatest film of all time. It's it like was the hottest script. Written yeah. by a young man named J.J. Abrams. It's Mike Nichols, wow. right? Directed by Mike Nichols. Yeah. 
It, and uh, that's actually it's based it's on what happened to CR. And you can tell if you knew CR minutes, in the nineties. I was a prick, really? yeah. complete asshole. Yeah. And then I shot him in the head. <laughs> and then he was fine. He's been a sweetheart ever since. Karen Allen, Apex Mountain. Uh, yes, Denholm Elliott had trading places the following year. Mm. Yeah, pivotal role in sure. that movie. That's a great eighteen. I don't know how we have. What do you think he did yet? with all that clout he acquired from Raiders and Trading Places? Denholm? I don't know. Not a lot. Did he buy the whip from the, the Indian Jones? Maybe movie? he bought it. Yeah. Booby trap Peruvian temples, definitely. <laughs> Cairo. I, I mean, Cairo's probably had a, a couple of other probably big better times. They've had some Human other history. accomplishments. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about this one? Nazis as movie villains. Well, you just mentioned Marathon Man. That's a pretty good. I was one. trying to think of what are the best. The, the Victory comes uh -huh. out this year as well, so we have Victory well, and, and Raiders. Also, same like year. you've got like the. They're not just like villains. They're like the other side of a war movie. So like then they're you know. Like Ray Fiennes and Schindler's Lists, you know what I mean, or yeah. whatever. Inglorious Bastards, that's a pretty great yeah, one. Yeah, that's good. Christoph Waltz. That's pretty good. I think I'll go, I mean, I think Waltz is better than Tot, but like oh, Nazis, yeah. it's just like, there's really, it's really satisfying to watch these guys get their fucking faces melted. Monkeys as uh, comedy movie things that go badly. It's like the apex of it being bad. Yeah, just yeah, like, I agree. get yeah. the fucking Reverse monkeys out of here. Mountain. Yeah. yeah. That the monkeys aren't cute. Yeah. Who are these for? Why is it like who would ever be like, oh, this is cool? This monkey's scratching at my face. You guys have a lot of monkey takes. Don't like monkeys. Me neither, actually. John Williams. It seems like his apex just lasted for 50 years. I mean, you're gonna go with Cinderella Liberty. He did the Poseidon Adventure. He did the Long Goodbye. He did Sugarland Express, Earthquake, Towering Inferno, all in one year. Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Superman. Superman was great. Mm -hmm. He did da, all of the da, Indian da, da, da. movies. He did Born on the Fourth of July. He did JFK. All right, so it's probably Superman. And Jurassic Park, too. I think Jurassic Park and Indy are over here. Superman is over here. Star Wars and Jaws are over here. Any other? I mean, we could do 40 Apex Mountains or we could just Fedoras? Oh. Move, fedoras in a movie. So Fedoras, it's either, it's either this. It's either like literally when they were in style in the 30s and 40s or whatever. Then there's this movie and then there's the Swingers revival. Right, when you started wearing it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think like being a, an, an American man in the 1940s and 50s is, is Apex, Apex Mountain, Mountain for fedoras. fedoras. Okay, great. Picking nits. I have a few. The dead Molina dummy is tough. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's not great. Indy taking 15 straight to the face punches from the bald Nazi, not barely a mark after, not great. Why didn't they just kill Indy seven points during the movie? Not great. Here's my biggest nitpick. Was Marion like John Paul Bonham? Like, how does she drink like that? She was 120 pounds. I know. Just throwing down liquor. Like, did she not have a liver? What was going on there? Do you have a friend like that? Who can not, just crush? Not like that. I've only seen that on like the and challenge. She's drinking like, <laughs> like mountain moonshine. Like yep. it's not like she's like, oh, this is like good, she's some some fine scotch. She's what are, drinking like what are she and Belloc drinking? Aquavit or something. Aquavit. But it's like his. He's like my family's vineyard, so I don't really know. But it seems like it's some sort of like liqueur or something. There yeah. are people like this though who can do this, especially in the well, like the thirties. I mean, yeah, I mean uh, the Irish. We don't have to. Tout their virtues. Yeah, I, being, I have, have some Irish familiarity with yeah. people who drink like this. But they're usually just sloppier and more belligerent. She's, she's just pretty, she's bouncing pretty pissed off, off a lot. You know, was she an alcoholic? You think, Chris? <sighs> if we were going to do a ten Maybe episode that's Netflix series, that's what I would make it about. I would I would get turn into leaving Las Vegas. Yeah, or exactly. Trauma. In treatment but when a man Marianne. loves a woman. <laughs> Yeah, in treatment should do movie characters. That actually is a, a, that should be the new season of in treatment. Harris, the Indy becomes Andy Garcia, and in when a man loves a woman, That's right. <laughs> my wife. I went through the garbage last night. <laughs> what I, I found do a with couple Marianne? bottles. <laughs> um, I just her drinking just flummoxes me. What what was your big pick in there, Chris? Well, I got two. One is I just feel like everybody is underreacting to the fact that they found the Ark of the Covenant. I just feel like there's just like a lot of German guys standing around being like, what's in that box? Oh yeah, it's the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's go listen to some jams over here or smoke So a what do you want? Like you want people reacting like they just won the title in the NBA or like what kind of reactions? You want handshakes? <laughs> High fives? What are you looking for? I think it would just for? be like a little bit more like it turns out the Bible is real. Like would have been hmm. like a big Oh, like deal. surprise. Yeah. And then on the flip side, how does Indy know 
that closing your eyes spares you from the ghosts coming out That's of That's the number one nitpick is what does closing your eyes meaningfully do? I mean, do obviously, they're the pure of heart. Of God? I think that's the thing is, like, if you're pure of heart, it, like, spares you, mm-hmm. I guess, right? Because the Nazi symbol gets melted off the box. So why close your eyes? I don't know. Maybe he got bad info. I don't know. <laughs> I would have had her close her eyes and melt like everybody else. Like, I told you not to close your eyes. <laughs> I have a picking nit. No, I'm single. Um, who's handling snake maintenance in that tomb? Right. How are they eating? How are they surviving? They're, I well, they're, they're coming in and out. From where? From the like the thing that he sees them coming in and oh, out. That hole. Right? But where are they coming from? They're in the desert. Yeah. I don't know how do snakes usually live. What do they eat? It's, not sand. I don't, <laughs> doesn't that seem strange to you that there are thousands of snakes? In Maybe this they're tomb? living on dates and monkey carcasses. <laughs> I, I <laughs> did, guess. Did Hitler really love the occult this much, or did they just shoehorn that in? Sean. <laughs> No, I just, I didn't know if that I was literally crazy. was like, let's go to our Hitler expert, Chris Ryan, was in the back of my mind, and CR just jumped right in front of me. I don't know. I don't know. I don't I, care to know. Apparently, he had like a fascination with this stuff, and yeah. then the movie capitalized on that. But like, did the audience even really, know that? I, the thing is, is that like, there's been so many movies where Hitler plays a part that I never know whether or not it's just like, yeah, Hitler loved the occult. Yeah, and I'm just huge like, Jeff sure. Bridges guy, Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Hitler hated Karen Allen. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like. If Hitler was a character in your movie, you could basically ascribe any sort of awful right. characteristic to them. Mm-hmm. The audience is just gonna be like, "Of course, yeah, that's he a loved, good point. He loved the occult. It's very believable in the movie. I it's don't like in Bastards, he's like obsessed with the movies, right? right. Yeah. I don't think that we totally get a sense though of like what it is he's gonna do with the arc. So like they in, clearly have miscalculated. I think it's like here. that if you uh, it, it, the the arc being found is supposed to signal like a messiah rising, and so he's like, if I find the arc, that means I'm the messiah. It's great PR. So what was Belloc doing in the desert then? Trying to what was he trying to channel? What were they? Why open it? I think Belloc was like going half and half there, where he's like, maybe this like maybe this works out better for me. And Colonel Dietrich was like, sure, open that box. Well, because he tells him he's like, if we get to Berlin and there's a bunch of sand in here, your guy's going to be pretty disappointed. Really backfired. Yeah. Could this be made as a 10-episode Netflix show? Karen's alcoholism, basically. <laughs> that's the direction you go. Um, I mean, they did make a young Indiana Jones TV series. Who was the star of that? Was there somebody that became famous? Well, River Phoenix is the star of Last Crusade. Of, in, of the prologue in Last Crusade. I don't remember Great. Who By the way, that was awesome. That was an stuff. awesome casting. I was so fired up when they did that. Sean Patrick Flannery uh, was Indiana Jones. Sean. Um, probably unanswerable questions. We've got a couple already. More details on Marion's bar. You think she was breaking even on that thing? It seems like more of a barter situation, you know? Did like, they have like video poker there? You know, big like business for her in Nepal. Yeah, Did cigarette some, machine. Is it like Cheers? Did she show the Champions League? Yeah, what was going on? <laughs> what was the TV situation? <laughs> Who was the norm of that bar? Um, why didn't Belloc's head exploding? become the go-to exploding head reference scanners. and not scanners. But this movie was way bigger than scanners. Yeah, but that's the, that head explosion is just way more satisfying. Because they do the fire in front of Belloc's face. Because it was too graphic. Because yeah, it was too, yeah, to keep the rating. The face melting even to this day, because people will be like, oh my God, Dame Lily melted my face last night. But if you put Tot's face melting, it's like, it's pretty graphic. You don't want to tweet that out too often. It's true. Yeah. Precursor for Poltergeist too, when he pulls his face uh, off. Yeah. Right. Love that part. I love anything with faces melting, skin bit getting pulled off always works in a movie. It's pretty disturbing when I was like five years old yeah. I saw it though. Yeah, it's fair. Uh, unanswerable question. This movie's worse with Tom Selleck, but is it that much worse? Is it still a $330 million movie? It's such an interesting one. I don't know. Because Tom Selleck, like you said, he goes on to be really successful. Because we're discovering shows, Tom Selleck but, I mean, in the movie, right? Yeah. We don't really have a background. We're yeah. pretty much discovering, well, Ford's Han, so I guess that's not true. We're what, discovering he can... Would it be better or worse if we put Gutenberg in the chair? What if What if Gutenberg had the bullwhip? Would that work Gutenberg, for you, Gutenberg, I think, was that's when we start losing money. <laughs> <laughs> Does E.T. happen without this movie? The odds are no, because Spielberg had an idea for a movie, and Melissa Matheson, who's Harrison Ford's girlfriend at the time, or wife, 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 uh, and Spielberg's like, I have this idea for a movie, and they start collaborating yeah. on E.T. on the set, which if this had been Kaufman as the director, we probably don't have E.T. Um, wow. It's a big one. Would you call it a man purse that Indy had, or would you call it a satchel? Satchel. So yeah. you go satchel. Yeah. Technically a man purse. 
I mean, he's got important items. You know? Why don't you have a satchel, Chris? I mean, I, I have a bag that my stuff is in. I have one. Do you here. want me to have, have like a, a, a Yeah, I call that my little girly man bag. <laughs> Do you want me to have like a like a like a bike messenger bag that I always wear? Satchel. You're a fanny pack guy, Chris. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, here's another one. Is Bill? Indiana Jones. Archaeologist or just looter? Well, this is the thing. That's that's one of the things that's aged the worst is like, you know, they got the British Museum returning artifacts. Like the the the, the tide is changing on museums. It was the tide was changing even in the moment. The archaeologist community. Led by Winifred Creamer. One of the greats. Uh, I was like, enjoyed Winifred's work. He <laughs> Obviously described, trying to cape up off of it, the Raiders of the Lost Ark popularity and Winifred trying to get his name in the So in he the papers, said, quote, right? Indiana Jones, the worst thing to happen to archaeology. And quote, walks a fine line between what's an archaeologist and what's oh, a professional Oh, because you get a lot of jagoffs leader. who are like, I want to be an archaeologist if that means I get to wear this yeah, hat. I just get to rob some, I'll wear yeah. a fedora while I rob some tomb. Yeah. Um, Imagine being an archaeology professor after this movie came out and all the clowns who enrolled in your class. Oh my God. Archaeology is really boring. Dude's walking into your room with like a whip. Yes. <laughs> when do I get to use this fucking thing? <laughs> um, what piece? Do you have any other unanswerable questions? Uh, I'm. It's unclear why they keep, like, it, everybody wants to give Marion a different outfit to wear in this movie. I feel like that happens multiple times. That's it, a good point. There was a thing about, like, they really wanted to get her into a white dress, but they have to get her out of, like... I, but like yeah, she does get dressed a few times yeah. for why no does reason. Belloc have a white dress in the know, middle of the desert K on a and date? And Katanga's just got like a slip and he's like, you might want to like rock this. I wonder if he's just used to like scooping up women on islands and Maybe. putting them in a slip on his pirate ship. But that is pretty weird. Yeah. Pretty weird. Also, it's I always laughed when you rewatch it. Sala is like really nonplussed that Marion's dead the first time around when they think she's dead. He's mm. just like tough beat, you know? Like, <laughs> Right. <laughs> He'll date again. Yeah. <laughs> this is related to the the bigger indie question, but like what is actually motivating Indiana Jones? Because it's not necessarily money. Certainly he likes going on the quest, but once he gets his hand on the item, he donates it to the museum. Yeah. And then what? Is it just that he's become an internationally renowned figure, like basically thief, culture thief? So it'd be like if you won the NBA title, but you just skipped the final ceremony yeah. and you were just like, I'll see you guys later. I'm getting yeah. ready for the next season. You mm. don't even like celebrate it. But also kind of skipped game seven. Yeah. And you're like, my, my team's got it. Like what? So it's not money. It's this weird I think perverted version of, of fame. I think it's like, I mean, they talk a lot about like being part of history in this mm -hmm. movie. Like, I think Belloc says that to him. He's like, this is what we always dreamed of is just like to hold history like this. Yeah, probably... This movie definitely doesn't need to be longer, but it probably needs like a 90-second scene of him explaining why this means so much to well, him. Well, in Last Crusade, they kind of sort of get into well, it I about the way like he was not, raised. Hitler not getting the Ark of the Covenant is like the main goal. Yes, but like what, the, the Peruvian idol, for example, like why does that piece of history matter to know. him? We don't know. I don't know. He's is just he like trying a, to sell it? No, I mean, it's like supposed to be on display in the museum. Yeah. It, wherever he's a teacher. Is it Princeton? It's supposed to be Princeton? Or what's he? What's he I'm not sure what school it is. But like, why would a professor of archaeology want to steal an idol from an ancient temple and bring it to a museum? It belongs in the temple. He's a white guy in 1935. Good point. <laughs> there's a lot. Of, I, I stayed away from it, but there's a lot of stuff on the internet about this and the fact that he's named Indiana and Indiana was one of the state the, yeah we don't need to go down that rabbit hole what piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie I love Katanga's so, turtleneck <laughs> <laughs> I should, I, should, I think I would go white turtleneck yeah would you want the actual arc uh, that the fake arc that they built oh I mean it seems like it would take up a lot of room. maybe it's like a coffee table though yeah. Just check out this gold like, coffee table I have. Hey, you got to use a coaster on that. That's the actual arc from Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Don't get your iced coffee on that, please. <laughs> Don't spill any matcha on my arc. Would you I, want the power of God? <laughs> power of God would be cool. I thought the medallion would be That's cool. That's how we should end the rewatchables is we open the arc and we see who gets out alive. <laughs> I thought it's pure of heart. It would be Craig. <laughs> I thought Indy's, Indy's uh, satchel would be cool. I thought the bullwhip would be cool. But yeah. I think the fedora is the answer. I'd like to park that boulder right in my driveway. That big boulder. And whenever I come over, just, down. Roll, <laughs> just roll it into my house. What, you don't, what do you want? The boulder? That's it? I just want to see one photo of Jeff Bridges as Indiana Jones. <laughs> you know, what could have been? Fedora, bullwhip, or satchel, if you had to pick one of those three. Satchel's the most functional, I think. 
Because fedora, you just get laughed out of a bar, you know? Satchel, most most people have. Like, I'd okay. like to take the fedora for a ride. Who won the movie? Ford. I think. I think Spielberg. Because I think this is when Spielberg is like, I am actually the king of Hollywood. <sighs> but he made Jaws. Yeah, but he he took an L on 1941, and then he was like, not only are you paying me one and a half million, but I get profit participation on this film and every other movie I make from henceforth. Are you going to zag and go And he Lucas? killed the Nazis. And he killed the um, Nazis. I thought this was a really tough one, but that it should be tough because this is one of the greatest movies of all time. We should have a really tough who won the movie. It's Ford and Spielberg in the finals. <laughs> I think it has to be Spielberg because when you throw in the E.T. part that as he's making this movie, he's also developing developing E.T. E. with Ford's wife kind of trumps and, and Ford and his wife got divorced. You got to factor that in. Spielberg ends up getting more um, out of the whole relationship. Are you saying that he caused the got, divorce? No, but he got E.T. out of Ford's wife. But I just feel like the combo of that makes it. And also he resuscitated a career that for whatever reason in 1979, um, became questioned. Mm. They wondered this fucking guy can't make a movie where he's not completely over budget and he's kind of lost the steering wheel. He made movies in the 80s and early 90s. Always, Hook, Color Purple has got a very nice oh, reception yeah. Yeah. that not are not great. great. Yeah, always is bad. But this is the movie that made him bulletproof. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the one that... I, just, I think it starts like a 20-year run for Ford. I think Ford's almost like underrated at this point. I'll tell you, he didn't win the movie, Jeff Bridges. No. I've, I've been thinking about it. It's not Kathleen Turner. It's Sean Young, I think, is really would have been the, that would have been the move. And she had only been in Stripes at that point? Yeah. Stripes is before this? Same year, right? Wow. Like, that would have been the all-time year, Stripes and Raiders. We have to um, do No Way Out at some point just so we can give Sean Young the Dion Waiters Award. It is an all-time... Is No Way Out an in-person rewatchables? No. Yeah. Like, I'm curious. <laughs> it's not, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, not like what's Because we've done Raiders and Goodfellas in person. I'm kind of curious for you, like, what's, what, what warrants in person for you? Well, those were two good choices. Yeah, they were great. Absolutely. Sean Young would have been good. I think you're right. I think, I think that might have been the best one for she recasting has, Catch. You know, she's, she can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and, like, snipe back at him and punch him. So then she's she very sexy at Runner? that time. I don't, well, I don't know. They're great together in Blade Runner. I know. It's a pretty good one. Who won the movie, Craig? Ford. Thanks, Craig. People, I mean, if you become like a Halloween character that people wear for like the next 40 years and kids would still like be into Indiana Jones today, he's a Disney ride. You, you got your stubble because Indiana Jones, right? Look at me, yeah. yeah. He spit an image. Yeah. You've been stealing idols around the world for yeah. years because of Indy. Yeah. I'll tell you what didn't win the movie, Tunisia. <laughs> Maybe not one ever go there. It sounds 130 degrees sounds awful. Yeah. I, I can't imagine it's can't gotten eat the cool food there either, right? Yeah. yeah. Yikes. All right. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Wow. It was good to see you guys. See you later, Tunisia. Bye, Tunisia. <laughs> uh, bye, everybody. We'll be back next week. Another rewatchable. See you then.